for some of them, but thank you. Yes.
Thank you. Welcome everyone to this afternoon's planning committee meeting. Before we start, I would like to confirm which committee members and officers are here. Thank you, Chair. So joining us uh, remotely for this meeting are councillors William Armitage, Jane Barry, Andrew Cooper, Peter Elliott, Mark Foster, Carol Huckabee, Mo Potts, Alan Powell, Tracy Reader, Jackie Ridgway, Kathy Rouse, Diana Ruff, and Ross Shipman. Also in the meeting room is uh, Councillor Barry Lewis, who's speaking today as a ward member. We have members of the planning team, Alice Lockett, Phil Slater, and Emily Cartwright. Jim Fieldsend is joining us from the legal team. Um, my, I'm Nicola Calvary, I'm the governance manager. I will facilitate this meeting. And also on the call are Alan, Damon, Martin, and Naomi from the governance team to support this meeting. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. As you know, we have a protocol in place for meeting in this virtual way, which I would now like the meeting facilitator to read out. Thank you, Chair. So this is just a reminder to all members of the committee to dress and behave during this meeting as if you would do if you were in the council chamber at Mill Lane. Please be aware the meeting is being streamed and I'm just about to press the record button to ensure that this meeting is recorded for the purpose of minute taking. You'll hear announcement just shortly over the stream. This meeting is being recorded. Um, a reminder to all members to speak through the chair. This means that you'll need to remain muted throughout the throughout the meeting um, to also to keep your camera on you can use the chat function to request to speak at any time um, alternatively you can raise your hand the chair should be able to see you but if not I will be assisting the chair to help her to be able to see all members should they wish to speak uh, a reminder for all members when they are wishing to speak to introduce yourself um, to say say uh, Council X representing Y Ward, so that the members of the public who are viewing this and participating in the meeting are um, know who you are. We will be doing voting during this meeting by roll call um, on every application. Please just be mindful of your home surroundings and appear alone when you're on camera. Um, and just that final reminder to keep your camera on throughout the meeting. We understand that Councillor Elliott is having some technical issues today. If he does turn off his camera, it's to do with his Wi-Fi. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. The first item on today's agenda is apologies for absence. Have we received any in advance? Chair, no apologies for absence have been received. And are there any other apologies? Chair, all the members are present. Thank you. The second item is declaration of interest. Members are requested to declare the existence and nature of any disposable pecuniary interest and or other interests not already on their register of interests in any item on the agenda and withdraw from the meeting at the appropriate time. Have we received any declarations in advance? Uh, Councillor Tracy Reid is indicating she wishes to speak, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Reader. Uh, I need to declare an interest in NED 20-00221, the Clay Cross application. Um, Chair, I will be speaking as a ward member on, on this application and I will leave the meeting at the appropriate time. Thank you. <clears throat> minutes of the last meeting. We now have the minutes of our meeting held on Tuesday the 17th of November 2020. Are we happy that they are a correct record? Is there a mover? Move it, Chair. Got Councillor Powell and Armitage on this one, Chair. Thank you very much. Is everyone in agreement with this? Thank you. <clears throat> that moves us on to the main business today. And as you can see, we have four applications, each of which has its own report marked as items 4A to 4D. I am happy with this and intend to consider them in that order. However, before we do this, I would like the clerk to explain for the benefit of members, speakers and the public who are watching on YouTube, how they will be dealt with. Right. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, this is the procedure for considering applications at the meeting. We will consider the four applications in the order that they are set out on the agenda. The Chair will introduce the application. 
then ask the planning officers, planning officers rather, to refer members to any late comments or updates received since the agenda was issued. The late items agenda supplement has been published on the council's website and the link has been sent to committee members. The planning officers will then give a brief presentation setting out the application plans and photographs from the site. The screen showing this presentation will be shared with those attending the meeting. They can also be seen on the council's website through its YouTube channel. Following on from this, the chair will ask each of the speakers, any ward members first, followed by objectors, then the applicant or their agent, to speak to the committee. Each speaker will have three minutes to put forward their views using the conferencing facility. There will be a reminder given by the clerk when 30 seconds remain. At the end of the speaker's three minutes, members of the committee will have an opportunity to ask the speaker questions, if necessary, in order to clarify any points that they have made. When we have heard from all of the speakers on an application, the chair will open up the meeting for debate by the committee and determination by a vote. Now a note here for the speakers. Once the application you've come to speak on has been dealt with, you may leave the virtual meeting room. If you choose to remain, then please mute your microphone and turn off your camera. You will not be allowed to participate further in the meeting from that point. As you are aware, this meeting is being live streamed. The council will make a recording for the purposes of preparing the minutes. Once the minutes have been approved by the committee, then this recording will be deleted. But please note that others may decide to record the live stream from the internet. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Before we move on to the first item, I'm just going to let you know, as we've got four applications this afternoon, we are factoring in a short break. And we're sort of aiming this to be around about the three o'clock time limit. So it may be sooner and it may be slightly afterwards, but that's what we're aiming for. Thank you. <clears throat> Move on to the first application. And this is the residential development of 34 dwellings, associated infrastructure and land opposite 24 to 44 Clay Lane, Clay Cross. I believe this is going to be heard by Phil Slater, the officer. If you'd like to do a presentation, you're there somewhere. Yes, thank you, Chair. When you're ready. Just waiting for the presentation to come on screen. I was just about to ask Phil, would you like me to do that for you? <laughs> yes, yes, please. Thanks, Nikki. That's great. Just have the first slide, please, Nikki. And the, the, Right. Thank you, Chair. Uh, first, I would refer members to the late comments report, which includes a number of objections from residents. I would also refer members to the comments from the applicant's ecologist in respect to the three sites for off-site mitigation. The three sites show a net gain in biodiversity to compensate for the losses on site. As set out in the report, the site falls outside of the settlement development limits for Clay Cross in the adopted local plan. The site is, however, a proposed housing allocation in the emerging local plan and is considered to be broadly sustainable. The development is for 34 dwellings, including bungalows, and 20% affordable housing will be provided, along with Section 106 contributions to secondary education, off-site play provision, and off-site biodiversity enhancement. This slide shows the application site in the centre, with Clay Lane to the south, open fields to the north, to the east is the Pressbrook and rear gardens of properties on Windermere Road. To the west is an area of trees, some of which have already been removed. The site generally slopes from east to west towards the brook. The next slide, please. Thank you. This shows the red line application site boundary. The next. West and Windermere Road. 
uh, in the eastern corner are a group of trees which are the former orchard and the proposals are to retain, retain parts of this area and enhance with fruit trees, native tree and shrub planting. To the south lies Clay Lane and existing properties on the opposite side of the road and to the north is open fields and further north lies Kenning Park. Have the next slide please. Uh, this slide shows on the left the site within the adopted local plan which lies in countryside and outside of the settled development limits. The slide on the right shows the proposed allocation for housing in the emerging local plan and the settlement redrawn around the site. The proposed allocation is for an estimated 25 dwellings. Uh, next slide please. This slide shows, this, shows that the site lies within flood zone one, however properties to the uh, west on Windermere Road are at a lower level than the site and lie within flood zones two and three. The lead local flood authority have not objected and have recommended conditions 19 to 22 in the report, which include details of maintenance of the brook. Next slide, please. This slide shows a proposed site layout for 34 dwellings, which are a mix of two, three and four bed dwellings, including bungalows and a 20% affordable housing, which equates to seven units. The layout is outward facing onto Clay Lane with a single point of access off Clay Lane. On the site boundary is the air vent to the Claycross Tunnel, which is a feature of the site, along with a footpath which is proposed along the frontage to run through to the orchard and a public footpath. In the southwest corner, to the bottom right of the screen, are the affordable units that front onto Clay Lane, along with a footpath link, which is also proposed in this corner. Car parking for these units is shown to the rear and off the turning head. In the eastern part of the site is an area of trees to be retained and enhanced as an orchard, so a number of these trees have already been removed, however, they are not subject to a tree preservation order. The northern boundary, which is the left hand side of the screen, faces outwards onto the fields and the bungalows proposed along this edge. To the west, at the bottom of the plan, lies the Pressbrook watercourse and opposite are the rear gardens of properties on Windermere Road. Trees will be retained on the bank to, to form a buffer to allow for the maintenance of both of the brook and for the otters. Condition 13 relates to an otter mitigation strategy. The next slide, please. This slide shows the landscape master plan. Trees along the brook are to be retained and trees in the eastern corner would form the heritage orchard. Additional planting is shown within the development and the new hedgerow to the frontage with Clay Lane. As referred to in the late comments report, the loss of biodiversity will be compensated for on three offsite locations which would demonstrate a net gain in biodiversity. Have the next slide, please. Uh, this is the tree removal and retention plan. The areas in red are the trees which are to be removed, along with the hedgerow which fronts onto Clay Lane. Trees to be retained along the eastern, northern and western boundaries are also shown. Thank you. Uh, the top picture is a, the street scene which fronts onto Clay Lane and shows the air vent in the centre. The access is to the right and the three units on the far left are the affordable units. The bottom picture shows the bungalows on the northern boundary with the fields. Thank you. Uh, this is two example house types. Excellent, thank you. And uh, two examples of semi detached houses with the affordable units to the left. This is a photo taken from the southwest corner. Looking north, the trees on the left line, the bank of the brook, and uh, Windermere Road lies beyond these trees. This is a view looking south back towards Clay Lane. The trees on the right are on the bank of the brook. The rear gardens of Windermere Road can be seen at a lower ground level from the side. This is a view of the brook with the rear gardens of the hand opposite bank. 
it's another view of the brook the application site is to the left and these trees are proposed to be retained just two photos taken looking approximately northeast towards the church spire uh, the left hand photo was taken last week and the right hand photo was taken during the summer top right is the area of trees that form the orchard This photo uh, looking east, trees in the centre of the screen, the tunnel vent can be seen in the top right. As can be seen from this photo, the land slopes down towards the brook. Thank you. Uh, again, two photos, he's taken from the southwest corner of the site looking east. On the right is a hedgerow that fronts onto the clay lane and is proposed to be removed as part of the development. This is a photo of the northern boundary of the site. You can just see the, the church spire on the left hand side. It's a photo taken from the northern boundary looking back towards Clay Lane and the air vent. The proposed access will be to the left of the vent. This is a view looking northeast towards the trees in the eastern part of the site. Another view back towards the northeast corner. Uh, the tree in the centre is supposed to be moved as part of the development. It's a view back towards Clay Lane with the trees on the left. This view is taken outside the site from a footpath looking southwest towards the site. Trees along the brook can be seen in the bottom right hand side of the photo. View looking down Clay Lane towards the proposed access and the air vent. The access is approximately where the white placard sign is. It's another view down Clay Lane. It's a view of the air vent and the field gate marks the proposed site access. It's a view looking back up Clay Lane opposite the access. View further down Clay Lane, the hedge on the opposite side is the one that's proposed to be removed. That's a view back up Clay Lane. To the left is the proximate location of the affordable units which would front on to Clay Lane. That's the end of the presentation. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Are there any points of clarification required at this point? Councillor Armitage, Councillor Rouse. Uh, yeah, uh, it's to do with uh, why do we need to take the uh, uh, the hedge out uh, that fronts the uh, you know where the uh, affordable houses are, and is the uh, uh, the air vent uh, is it to uh, a pit shaft or a, a railway line, and is it active? Uh, with regards to the air vent, it's to the Clay Cross Tunnel. Right. So it's okay. active? Yes. Yeah. Right. And the trees? Uh, well, well, the, the issue of the trees and the hedgerow is, is, is covered within, within the report, um, which is uh, through the chair. Is, is that not for questions? At, at towards yeah, questions the, for officers the, later, Chair, perhaps? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Rouse? Yes, um, it's Cathy Rouse, Councillor Rouse for Claycross North. Um, I think for me, I'll probably have to ask the question later um, because I want to know, because I don't live too far from this, why has the land been cleared before any agreement's been made as to whether we give permission or not permission? Again, Chair, I would have thought that'd be for questions later. Officers yeah. later. Thank you. Okay. Any other points for clarification before we move on? Right, we should move on to now asking the uh, speakers to speak. And we have the first speaker is Councillor Tracy Reader. She's a ward member. Uh, I think um, Councillor Shipman was indicating he wanted oh, to sorry. speak for me. Sorry. Councillor Shipman. Sorry, Chair. It's just something that came to me last minute. Um, when you was giving your presentation, uh, Philip, the um, 
you mentioned, I, I saw on one of the slides that the application was for 25. I'm sure my papers say 35. Can you just clarify uh, which one that yeah. is? No, it was, it was to point out that the proposed allocation within the local plan is for an estimated 25 dwellings. This right, application okay. is for 34. I feel, thank you. Okay. Before we move on, is there any chance of the volume being uh, turned up in here? We can barely hear. I'll just come along now, Chair. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Councillor Reader, if you'd like to start. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for allowing me to speak on this uh, application today. I want to urge the committee to listen to the residents surrounding this development and oppose this application. The reasons I request that this committee reject the application is that the site is, with, uh, is outside the settlement limit of the current local plan. I'm aware that the emerging local plan is not yet completed and therefore, even though it's at a very advanced stage, I'd urge the committee to apply the current arrangements. Within the emerging local plan, the site has been identified as a potential site for 25 homes and this application is for 34. And as pointed out by the parish council, will potentially create an issue with a piece of land that fronts onto Clay Lane and adjacent to footpath 13. I also don't believe that the 20% of affordable homes is enough and with current climate at the moment I think that Clay Cross people locally would find it extremely difficult to afford homes. I draw your attention to the comments submitted by Clay Cross Parish Council colleagues of which I fully concur. I and the Parish Council have concerns with regards to the potential loss of heritage value and the historical links contained within this site I would ask the committee that they place weight on and preserve some of Clay Cross's valuable history with regards to the uh, Grade 2 listed air vent that's located within this site and is associated with Clay, Clay Cross Tunnel. I would argue that to complete a housing development around this would detract and distract away from uh, Clay Cross's valuable history. In terms of flooding, which has been a concern for many years on this site, the nearby Pressbrook has always been a problem. The area is known to have flooded at least four times in the last few years, and I'm sure that the committee have heard from residents regarding their experiences of the flooding in this area. I'm sure they've shared lots of pictures and things with you. Um, I also believe that building on this site would exasperate the problems for residents on nearby Windermere Road. And I also believe it would increase flooding to other areas and neighbouring streets and the lower area of Clay, Clay Lane. 50 seconds remain. Okay. I and the Parish Council feel that building on this site has the potential to adversely impact on other nearby sites, including Kenning Park and St Bartholomew's Church, which is located just up the road. Clay Cross is very keen to have a, a really rich biodiversity and declared a climate change emergency last year. And we really would like to have more areas of untouched uh, a, a green space in which wildlife can really thrive. And this area has got its own share of, of biodiversity. I don't yeah, think that's three can... minutes. Oh, thank you. Sorry. I hope thank the you. residents can kind of give more. Are there any questions for Councillor Reader? No, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mandy Bingham. Hello. Hello, Mandy. You have three minutes starting when you're ready. Hi, I'd just like to say that Clay Lane is, a, is just a lane. It measures 4.3 metres at narrowest, creating bottlenecks and 4.9 metres across from the proposed entrance site. It also has a 7.5 tonne weight limit. It's inadequate to sustain any further traffic and cannot cope with traffic that's on there now. Um, it also has a problem with parked cars, which limits parking spaces. It's unable, you're unable to see past it. And once you're committed, you're on that right way, whether it's your right way or not, you, you're sub, sub, substantial in oncoming traffic. Limited parking on the site itself is 
meaning that they only allow 1.5 spaces per dwelling, which is less than North East Derbyshire's recommendations, would um, impact on the uh, airway safety by forcing more park traffic onto there uh, and making it very, um, very unsafe. Um, and also, I think everybody's underestimated the fact about how many people actually use cars and car ownership, which is against national planning policy framework. And it's also uh, been investigated in Claycross 2020 regeneration framework, where they found out that 88% of local people already travel by car. Um, and that breaches national planning policy framework where it says it's failed in access and development on, ca on car own ownership. Um, there's also been a, a refuge swept an analyst done and it shows that the dustbin wagon itself would contravene white lines by at least 500 mil. On, also on photographs that's already been shown by Philip Slater just which shows the lane being just a lane and one of the bends it show, shows that the vehicle, the dustbin vehicle turning left out of that proposed development side would actually have to either contravene and go onto the pavement or go up Clay Lane on the wrong side of the road into oncoming traffic by at least 50 metres, not returning to its same side, its proposed side of the carriageway until opposite, I think it's uh, number 20 on Clay Lane. And also the plan's uh, visibility display 2.4 by 43 is totally unachievable when turning right. And it, it would also cause um, a, a concealed entrance for traffic to coming off the clay lane up towards um, the development itself, meaning that with the, the, um, the tunnel, uh, the air shaft being where it is, it only leaves actual visibility of 21 metres, which does not allow for the stopping distance of 23 metres, and unless the plans have been drawn by somebody that feels that everybody can actually Three see Three minutes, it. Chair. Okay. Are you having problems, Chair? Sorry, the next speaker, Fenella Jones. Good afternoon, everybody. Sally Chair, just before that, was, was there any questions to uh, the previous speaker? I, oh, sorry, did that not come across? <laughs> uh, sorry, Chair, no, we, uh, if it did, I missed it. I take that members have got no questions? No, thank you. Right, sorry, Chair. If you'd like to start, Fenella, when you're ready, you have three minutes. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so my name is Sven Jones and I live at number 34 Clay Lane. I've lived here since 1988 and in 2000 we bought the house next door, come both, both houses to one to uh, make the house suitable for our growing family. To put things in perspective, our house is directly opposite the tunnel vent that has been shown in all the, the previous photographs shown by planning officer Mr Slater. When we bought this house there was no provision for any building on the lamp field opposite. Um, the only proposals there were in 74 and 76 for one dwelling, which were both refused for obviously very good reasons. This local plan states that this development should be reduced from 42 to 25 properties based on the council standard density calculation. So my first question is, why are we even considering a proposal of 34 houses? Currently, Claycross has two large developments taking place, which will create over a thousand new homes. Uh, St. Modwin and Avent on, um, by the Bywater site are in addition to other large developments on the A61 corridor currently being developed by Kia, Bellway and Taylor Wimpy, all within North East Derbyshire District. And this is excluding all the development to the north of the district at Johnfield and Eckington. I object, object to this proposal based on the following grounds. Traffic and access to the site for 34 houses. As Mandy has just stated, um, most of the um, access um, uh, considerations um, have been a little bit 
um, shall we say, perhaps understated in the planning officer's um, pr 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 presentation. I would like to see that um, a proper evaluation of the traffic for this, this site be taken out. I understand that the highways have only done a desktop analysis on this due to COVID. I think it now warrants something a bit more um, substantial in terms of actually having a look as to how narrow this lane is. Access to services and infrastructure, the level of housing, housing building, house building in this area is already at a high and any further house building will only put extra strain on existing services such as health and schools. Whilst a new primary school for Wingworth has been proposed, there is nothing to say what extra provision for secondary school education will be made. So I, I can't see the, the, the merit in- 30 seconds remaining. Thank you. So I would also like to say um, that the, the environmental issues um, of which have been touched on, flooding, noise pollution, um, all have uh, an impact on, on habitat. And I think the merit that the planning officer alluded to uh, perhaps is not correct. That's um, three minutes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Have we any questions for the speaker? Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Richard Barr. Hello. 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 We can hear you, we can't see you. Mr. Barr no, is no, joining I'm... us by telephone. Oh, oh okay. That's no, fine. Sorry. Mr. Barr, you have, three you have three minutes. Right, uh, main objections are uh, in relation to what's been mentioned overlooking. Um, it's been mentioned that the trees on the riverbank at Press Brook act as a buffer. Well, if you want to come and have a look at this time of year, they do offer some uh, uh, affordability, some of some uh, cover during the summer months when they're in leaf. But currently, after leaf fall, it's a, it's a straight view on the site, which is elevated from Windermere Road. Uh, directly into our our properties which make which makes you look like you're in a fishbowl yeah so that's one of the issues and is anything going to be considered in relation to adding to that buffer um in relation to to cover that point and what the main issue is in relation to what's been mentioned is it flooding now press brook itself turns into smithy brook under the uh, road bridge and if anybody cares to take a walk down Mill Lane and look at the state of the river down there, where there's at least three trees what's fell to the uh, river and are acting as obst obstructions to the flow, and any sort of rubbish or leaves what fall down there, uh, at leaf fall, it gathers. Now, this is something I've took up myself before with Derbyshire County Council, the Environment Agency, and various other organisations, Seven Trent Water, to who is responsible for this. Within our deeds, it states that we have to keep our bit of uh, river clean. Now, as I say, this is this is going to exasperate the flooding issue. We've seen uh, last November, if you look at, uh, again at off, the, off, the, off the road bridge, there's a pipe runs across and the water top to that pipe last November when we had the bad storms, the named storms. So, as I say, nobody seems to be taking responsibility and this flooding issue is really, really serious and a threat. And it doesn't seem to be anybody's responsibility to, to keep this water course clear and assist with the flow. And we know currently this field acts as a sponge and soaks up a lot of the rainwater. Uh, obviously, when that's removed and it's made into hard standing tarmac concrete, and the, the, the top water then is going to be directly drained into the uh, into the press brook and just make the situation worse and worse. And there's also remaining. Uh, right, there's, there's also the uh, Coop Lane development, which is then going to be also be put into this press brook, which again just adds more water flow to this uh, narrow uh, water course, which hasn't been cleaned out for at least 30 years after the last flooding in 1982 on these properties when they were under four foot of water. So I'm just wondering 
where we're going to go with that. Has, has anybody even considered that? Because it, it, it really, really needs looking at. And That's three minutes, situation. Chair. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Barr. Thank you. Thank you. Are there Thank any you. questions? No? Thank you, Mr. Barr. We'll move on to the next speaker, Richard Eden. Hello, Hello Mr. Eden. You have Hi. Minutes. Thank you, Chair, for this chance to speak. Uh, right, basically, I live at Six Windermere Road um, and I'm in flood zone three. Um, my property is the lowest property on Windermere Road. And we constantly have flooding from our combined sewers, which is sewers and surface water. Uh, Seven Trent are aware of this and said it's just down to being hydraulic, which is obviously from uh, heavy rainfall. So every year we have this problem. Now, the brook flooded in 1980 and it flooded all the gardens and it was four foot in this house. Uh, now, Philip Slater showed you the pictures of the field, but it's, they've not showed you the northwest corner, which is actually lower than the rest of the field. That is actually our floodplain. When the brook breaks its banks, it actually flows into there and it's our safety net. Their plan is to raise that land to make their new development safe from flooding. By doing this, all right, and they're also on about draining their surface water into the brook, They've took our safe net away, which will create the water to flow over the banks and come down the gardens, and I will get flooded. You, uh, also, you've got to think about there's a majority of old people that live on this uh, road who can't speak up for this, and I'm speaking on their behalf as well. We have got uh, Mr. Clark, who is bedridden, and he is uh, in bed downstairs permanently. Now, if this was to get flooded, his life could be at risk from this. Uh, we've had no help in the past from North East Derbyshire for flooding. And it's, I think we need to look at that before anything is looked at about giving somebody planning permission to exaggerate the, the problem because their surface water, they're saying they're going to drain it off at, a, at the rate of the field, but they've already chop the trees down which take considerable amount of the water and they've not done the assessment before they've taken the trees down so they're not going about it in the right ways i can also tell you as well i know this isn't probably relevant but prevectors say they own the land as well i have got a deed they've only owned it registered it since 2018 i have got a deed and conveyance which states the land isn't theirs i'm not willing to give it now but I will give it if anybody wants it uh, the true owners of the site so that proves that they have, registered that they have registered that under their own name uh, fraudulently and I can prove this by deeds and a conveyance thank you thank you Mr Eden are there any questions for Mr Eden no thank you we'll move on to the next speaker Mr Mark Allen uh, we were expecting uh, Mr. Allen, Chair, but uh, he hasn't actually arrived. Uh, we're not sure whether he's given apologies or not. So on that basis, um, if he arrives, then while well, this is still being considered, perhaps he could be uh, uh, given access then. But otherwise, it's uh, the next speaker would be Darren Abbott, um, who's the agent for the scheme. Thank you. Um, Mr. Abbott? Hello. Hi. You've got three minutes. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to address the committee. I am Darren Abbott of the DLP Planning Limited, representing the applicant Woodall Homes, who I'm delighted to have the opportunity to progress the application site. As detailed in the officer presentation, this is a contained parcel of land neighbouring existing development in the settlement of Clay Cross. This is a highly sustainable location of one of the district's main towns where the majority of development growth will be directed. The site is allocated for residential development in the advanced emerging local plan under policy LC1, contributing to the district's housing supply to meet identified requirements. The settlement boundary is also to be altered and effectively absorb this site. 
The proposals offer well-related, high-quality, sustainable development accessible to local services and facilities, delivering a choice and mix of homes to a range of two, three and four bed properties with 20% affordable housing provision. The proposals also include six bungalows, which not only meets the general housing need, but offers a provision for people with disabilities and or those wishing to downsize, thus potentially freeing up larger housing stock as is advocated in the National Planning Guidance. The Council's Housing Officer identifies a shortage of bungalows in Clay Cross and notably a substantial need for affordable housing. We have worked closely with officers and key statutory consultees throughout the application process to ensure compliance with planning policies, and this has resulted in no stat statutory objections against the scheme. This includes County Highways, the Local Lead Flood Authority, the Environment Agency and Derbyshire Wildlife Trust. The Environment Agency detailed that the site is not at a heightened risk of flooding and is consistent with the sequential approach to development prescribed in national policy. A site-specific flood risk assessment as also supports the submission, concluding that the residential proposals are suitable. Flood risk will not increase on the site or elsewhere, a view that is shared by the Local Lead Flood Authority. Robust ecological assessments have also been undertaken and highlight the site's limited ecological value and poor species diversity. Whilst removal of some of the lower quality trees will occur, the proposals incorporate a comprehensive landscaping scheme with native species, supplementary planning of fruit trees and wildflowers for seasonal interest, as well as enhancement of the historical orchard. Vegetation along the brook is also to be retained and sensitively managed, ensuring that its functionality and riparian habitat is to be maintained. A net gain in biodiversity will be provided, which includes habitat creation and, and enhancement, both on and off-site, with associated 30-year management. To ensure that the required infrastructure is in place to support the development on delivery, the applicant is committed to providing the full suite of planning obligations requested. This includes contributions towards enhanced education provision at Tupton Hall School and enhancement of recreational play park facilities at Clay Lane and Kenning Park. In conclusion, be reminded that this is an allocation in the emerging local plan in a highly sustainable location with no objections from statutory consultees and provision of robust evidence clearly supporting the proposals. We would welcome your support. That's three minutes, back, Chair. Back in your officer recommendation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Abbott. Are there any questions for Mr. Abbott? Councillor Foster, Councillor Armitage, Councillor Rouse. Yeah, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I've heard quite a lot about uh, flooding concerns from previous objectors and uh, other members of <coughs> this committee uh, about flooding in different areas uh, to do with the Pressbrook and uh, the, the, the high levels during periods of heavy rain, which it says uh, in flooding. Um, you mentioned uh, earlier, uh, Mr. Abbott, that uh, about the, uh, the the flood authority, the lead local flood authority, and uh, the other studies that have been done. Could you put my mind at rest? Uh, they've raised no concerns those studies and uh, the flood authority, but could you put my mind at rest by just explaining and uh, a little bit more about that, about what was brought up? Because we have heard a lot about uh, flooding concerns, and we we only went over it very quickly there that no concerns have been raised. So could you just yeah. uh, um, uh, tell me a little further, thank you. Certainly. So as a starter for 10, the, um, the site is detailed by the Environment Agency to be flood zone one. Now that is the lowest risk of flooding. So if it's not at a heightened risk, i.e. flood zone two or three, or a functional floodplain, then everywhere else by default is, is flood zone one. Now, the, the, the sites, um, or to the west of the site, the properties on Windermere Road, they are in flood zone three, and that's largely as a result that they are at a lower ground level than the application site itself. And that and that's possibly results in the application site being flood zone one because of its elevated land levels already. Now, the application is supported by um, a flood risk assessment and a drainage strategy um, alongside it and what that does national planning policy requires the sites of greater than a hectare that a flood risk assessment site specific one actually builds upon the information provided by the environment agency and and what that um, looks at is is there going to be a risk of flooding on site and is there going to be a risk of any development exacerbating flooding issues elsewhere and that's been um, prepared by a, a a national um, consultancy in that regard. Now, um, their conclusions is that that, that the, 
that it won't increase flooding on site and there won't be increased flooding elsewhere, coupled with the drainage strategy that's been um, identified for this particular site. So that accords with the, with the planning policy in that regard. Now, the drainage strategy is intended that um, runoff rates or, 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 or the drainage that, that will outfall into the, into the press book is no greater than greenfield rates. So in, in essence, you, won't, you shouldn't be able to see a, um, a, a change from what already occurs. And the system has been designed with the relevant calculations to do that. Now, these reports have been reviewed and assessed by the, um, by the Environment Agency, by the Local Lead Flood Authority, and their conclusions are that, um, that it is acceptable and the scheme put forward um, accords with policy and doesn't increase the risk of flooding um, both in the site and elsewhere equally. Thank you. Councillor Armitage. Thank you, Chair. It's uh, really the, uh, the flood uh, aspect that uh, sure. uh, Councillor uh, uh, Foster has uh, uh, mentioned it's uh, you say that you're going to all the surface water will go into that brook am i right the the, the, the surface water that will be, be captured as part of the drainage system system yes that will be tanked and then it, the, the flow will be attenuated out of the site into press brook now um the 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 issues, as I understand, that are being raised with flood risk on site at the moment are the fact that there's actually a collapsed sewer, a seven trench sewer that um, that runs through the site. And if, if you've got a copy of the, um, the site plan to hand, you'll see that it uh, runs from the western boundary and then kind of navigates its way through along the road network as is proposed up to the northern boundary. And that's the sewer that's collapsed at the moment. Now, that is due to be repaired in January as part of the proposals. So the, the, the flood risk issues that have been identified, um, some of which are caused by that, will be, uh, will be remedied in, in, in that regard. Then equally, there's also permeable paving as well that is proposed that will allow um, rainwater where it falls to absorb into the ground and then equally a comprehensive landscaping scheme with the, coupled with the gardens the orchards the hedgerows and the trees that are proposed for the site that will absorb uh, rainwater where it falls you, you've also mentioned about uh, cleaning up uh, press brook will you actually be lowering the base of it uh, and we're not really talking about uh, uh, sewage on this one, uh, yes, the, there is a, a, a collapsed sewer, and presumably you'll be uh, connecting into that. Will that sewer be big enough to uh, take these uh, 30 odd houses? Yes, yes, we've got confirmation um, that, that that is acceptable from um, from Seven Trent Water. And this will be done before the, hou before the houses are even built? It's, yes, it's programmed in for January, yes. Right. OK, it's just the, the fact that you've got all these uh, drives, tarmac and all the rest of it. Sure. And yes, you've got tanking and all the rest and this sort of thing. But when it rains, and it rains particularly heavily, that uh, tank will be overflowed and it'll go straight in. It will also uh, carry with it uh, toxic things from uh, these... Uh, these ro the roadways because tarmac is uh, pretty toxic and if you go into the water course you've got a problem there and well an ecological problem yeah the, uh, the, be taking this into consideration yeah absolutely the drainage the drainage um system that's being designed is there to account for this and extreme storm events and it also has um, filters and interceptors that will prevent any such um, contamination of, of the water course clearly that is that is paramount um, and equally the, um, the the drainage um, in terms of surface water will be wholly contained within the site and there's also a, a, again in the committee report you'll see a condition relating to pre-construction drainage as well to make sure that that when the site is developed during those periods that equally there'll be a suitable drainage system in at that time uh, uh, if i may uh, chair if i must add uh, it's been brought about who actually owns this site 
The ownership um, has been raised during the, the application and the correct notices have been served on the landowners. Um, ownership is a, is a private civil matter and not one that is uh, material to consideration of a planning application. But we have, um, our legal advisors have responded and there's no concern over the ownership of this site, contrary to those raised by um, neighbouring occupiers. Thank you. Thank you for that, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Rouse? You're on Hello. Mute. Hello. Have I moved it now? Yep. No, you're back on mute. Right. Good afternoon, Mr Abbott. Um, a couple of things Hello. for me. Um, previous, you mentioned about the flood risk assessment. Could you tell me, please, if that flood risk assessment was done as a desktop exercise or was it that you, you know, some engineer went out and looked at it? Yes, it would have been. It would have been um, initially as a desktop appraisal, as any of these reports are, but then it would have been followed up by site specific um, a visit and with, fur with further works thereafter. Right. And if um, we requested to have a look at that, would we be able to see that? Yeah, it's, it's, it's all online. It's in the public domain. Obviously, it's part of the planning application submission um, particular. So it'd be on the council's website and that was submitted as part of the um, original uh, package um, earlier this year. OK, uh, the last one from me. Uh, previous, um, Mr Richard Eden, you mentioned about the northwest corner and being in flood zone three. Uh, it, it, is it, sorry, is that, is that a question? Is it flood zone three or is it, is it, it not? It's, no, no, he's Mr. Obviously, Mr Eden said yeah. in the northwest corner that is in flood zone three. OK, uh, that, that, that's contrary to the, the details that the Environment Agency provide. Right. Which identifies for zone one or by default, the lowest risk of flooding. Right. I'm not too far from this area sure. and I've, I've lived all my life. And for me, I'm thinking this could be an officer's a question for the officer, but I'm not. I'm going to ask you, could you tell us why has the site been cleared already before permission has been granted? So there has been some, some clearance on site um, to allow some further site investigation works to take place initially, um, noting that those were low quality, um, uh, low level shrub or trees that have been removed to date, but none of those have got tree preservation, as would be your right for, for a site that doesn't contain those at present. But the purpose of that was to, to, uh, to undertake some, some site investigation works. Um, uh on the site essentially right okay i mean i i agree with the gentleman um uh, with mr eden actually with knowing that plot and i'm sure councillor armitage will back me up on this because i'm sure he knows the clay lane very well and so does councillor reader it has always been a problem down there of flooding even when i was a small child every winter it would flood so i'm hoping that you will consider this this committee will consider this lightly. I, me personally, I don't think it's going to be good, but that's not my decision in the end. And thank you for Darren for answering me those questions. No problem. Thanks. Excuse me, Chair. Um, can I just uh, interrupt for a moment? Um, some of the uh, speakers have um, been using the uh, chat function effectively to uh, comment on sort of points which they've heard and take further part into the discussion. Now, it was made clear at the start of um, the way in which the process works is that um, speakers will have their three minutes and then we'll have the opportunity to answer any questions from members. I think that has to apply to the chat function as well. So I'd be grateful if those still in the room only use the chat function effectively for the modalities of actually taking part in the meeting. So in other words, you know, if they make sure that they've actually got the access details and things like that, rather than to actually provide a commentary on the work of the committee. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Are there any further questions? Councillor Shipman? Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, and thanks, Ms. Abbott, for your presentation. Um, what I was going to ask is, do you, do you accept that the, perhaps the collapsing of the drainage is not where the problems are, given the fact that it flooded in 1987? That sounds to me 
like it's an historic problem and not something that would be caused recent more recently by a collapsed drain in the system. And do you also accept that it's it's always going to be a given that you, if you're building on higher ground, you're going to cause problems, even if it's slightly increase, cause it, think, the increase in the problem on lower down properties that are on the same floodplain. Because it sounds to me like like you 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 right, trying to skip over this flooding problem by perhaps blaming the collapsed sewage, uh, collapsed drainage, when really there's perhaps more to it than that being the issue. If it's been happening for 30 odd years now, um, there's, there's, there's clearly a, a historic problem is what I'm getting at. Okay. Um, so, so first and foremost, I don't think we're, you know, certainly not intending to blame this collapsed drain for or sewer um, for for any flooding issues that that may have occurred on site. But that could have been the the cause of of recent events. But I think the fact remains that this has been thoroughly assessed. Um, by drainage experts, both in terms of preparing the flood risk assessment, the site-specific flood risk assessment, the drainage strategy, and then also the, the governing body for flood risk in the district, the local lead flood authority, the county council in that regard. So whilst, you know, I, I, I'm not in a position to dispute that there's been a flood event historically in the 1980s but what i would say is that you know we don't know the cause for that even if if that if that were to occur um but what i would say is that the, if there were technical evidence that were put forward to counter the the site specific um flood risk assessment that the that even our uh, engineers could review or the uh, the county council as the responsible authority that are raising let's be clear no objection to this then then they would have regard to that but that has not been submitted you've got the environment agency that is saying this is this is the lowest risk of flood um, lowest flood risk site um, you've got a flood risk assessment that corroborates that a drainage strategy that, that will ensure that all the surface water contained uh, is contained within the site and that any uh, and, and, and that the, um, the discharge of that will be no greater than the greenfield rates that currently occur into the press brook so on in that regard um, you you, you Ultimately, the statutory consultees are raising no objection for those very reasons. The Environment Agency, the, um, the, the local lead flood authority, and also Seven Trent Water. So I, I you know, I, I can't account for what's happened in the past because simply there's been no evidence put forward in that respect. The, the other question I had was in terms of the uh, biodiversity and the wildlife announcement. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that there were perhaps there were going to be something on site uh, from the documents I've read that all the stuff seems to be off site. So I just wondered what it is you had planned for the site uh, to enhance that area, obviously once houses go on. Certainly, certainly. So this is a, obviously this is a, a, an allocation in the emerging local plan and it's a relatively modest size site, just one and a half hectares. And this will be an issue that will crop up more and more moving forward. Um, there's, a re there's a requirement to have um, biodiversity net game, and that's set out in national planning policy. And it will be you know, reinforced legally once the environment bill is, is mandated um, likely next year. Now, where you have a greenfield site with development, inevitably there will be a biodiversity loss. And as the ecology report that has assessed the site um, notes this is of of a, of a low quality now this the, the the scheme is supported by a comprehensive landscaping scheme which is to be which is uh, to be dealt with by condition but indicatively we have um, submitted a, a master plan in that regard and that's been prepared by um, a specific landscape architects um, that will include native planting it will include um, enhancement and reinstatement of the orchard it will include supplementing and renewing the hedgerows and it will include things like wildflower uh, um, and seasonal bulbs and, th and those will be on site then coupled with that because there is the requirement for additional biodiversity gain 
there are um, broad principles that we've agreed in consultation with the, the Wildlife Trust and the Council's Parks team for three other sites within within the locality and one is directly opposite are the um, the play park at clay lane also at charlie park to the east and at um, exto pavilion which is to the north of the um, north of the settlement and again that, that that's conditioned but we have provided broad principle in that regard which are which are available to view and that would result in a net gain in biodiversity Thank you. Councillor Cooper, did I miss you? Did you want to speak? No, okay. Councillor Armitage? Yeah, if I could just uh, come back again, uh, Chair. It's to do, uh, you mentioned about this orchard uh, and all this uh, biodiversity. Who's going to look after this orchard? Because I am uh, I know there's an orchard uh, behind the fire station in Clay Cross. And all that happens there is that uh, the trees have uh, a, a massive amount of apples and they just drop on the floor and rot. And sure. no one seems to bother. So who's going yeah. to look after this? This, this, to... this, this will be secured by a, a management company um, and that'll be secured by a legal agreement. So that'll be the, the long term management of the of the public areas on site, which will include the orchard and it, indeed the, um, the wooded. Uh, margins to the to the periphery of the site as well and will it also uh, to do with the management of uh, press brook it, yes it's the applicant's responsibility as landowners to maintain that brook yes within their ownership right are there any further questions thank you mr abbott adrian i believe you wanted to come in and say a few words it's very briefly at this point, if, if I may, Chair, there's been some uh, discussion during the, the speaker's comments to members about the air vent that's on site. I just want to make it clear, Chair, that the air vent itself isn't a listed structure, but the southern portal to the Clay Cross Tunnel, which is some distance to the south of the site, that is a listed structure. But just to avoid any confusion with that, Chair, and also there was some discussion about land ownership during the, the speaker's comments. I know Mr Abbott commented on that, just to reiterate that, Chair, that all the um, suggestions made regarding land ownership have been investigated as far as we can by officers and the appropriate assurances have been given to us, Chair, that the relevant notices and notifications have been undertaken. So from that point of view, we are satisfied that issues have been addressed, Chair, and as Mr Abbott has suggested, that isn't a matter that members need to uh, take consideration of this afternoon. I'm happy to uh, answer any other questions as appropriate, Chair, when and if members have them. Thank you. Alan, I've got one question for you before we move on, and I'll come back to you, Councillor Rouse. Um, I've just looked at my notes, late amendment notes. On page 16, it's got a, a request to have a letter read out. Is this acceptable or is it just gone out with the notes? I'm not sure what that's from, Chair. It could well be that it's from a previous thing. Certainly there isn't any letter at this stage to be read out. Okay, thank you. Thank you. To miss it. Councillor House. Thank you, Chair. It was just um, a little bit um, that I was looking at and I needed to, obviously, uh, Mr Abbott to address it, um, if possible, Chair. Uh, Mr Abbott, are you still there? Hello, yes, yes, still here. <laughs> okay, not, thank not you. I'm not falling asleep. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. It's just a, just a quick one. Um, it's on page 23 of 4.46 about the Coal of, Authority. Of the committee report. Yes. Yeah. Um, and it states in there, the Coal Authority has commented that it concurs with the conclusion and recommendation of phase one desktop study report and coal mining risk assessment dated March 2020 based on the professional opinion of the BSP consulting that there is currently a risk to the proposed development from former coal mining activity. In, a, in an order to confirm the exact ground conditions present beneath and within this site to inform remedial mitigationary measures required to ensure that the development is safe, stable. Um, 
intrusive site investigation should be undertaken prior to the development. And that has come from the Coal Authority. Yeah, so I believe, I believe that's in connection with the, um, the phase one death study to con concerning ground conditions and contamination and, and equally a coal mining risk assessment. And what that requires is that the, the, typically then the phase two um, is, is intrusive works within the ground to understand essentially what, um, what remedial and or mitigatory requirements um, there are in order to deliver the development, but in principle, what the what the coal authority is saying, and indeed the um, the Envir uh, environmental health officer um, and the environment agency in, in their capacity concerning contamination, is that there's no barriers to development in that regard from from the information they have in concerning the, the phase one site investigation, which is obviously not to be confused with the flood risk assessment or the um, the drainage strategy. The separate, completely separate reports. Thank you. Are there any further questions? Councillor Shipman? Sorry, just one more as I've just been reading further on. You know, and I'm hearing what's been said. You know, the um, the air vent, that's for the train, right? Has there been any studies on air pollution in that area? Because I would have thought if people are living next door to an air vent, there's some issue, some health issue that could possibly be. Is that has that been thought through? Are we because I've not seen anything when I've read through, so I, don't, I just don't know if that's been done. Yeah, already. sure. I, I, again, we'd be guided by the council's environmental health officer in that regard, and and usually if there's a concern concerning air quality and the like, there would be um, requests for an air quality assessment, which which there hasn't been in this instance. So that so the environmental health team haven't haven't requested such. Um, such details to be put forward in that regard. But in terms of the layout, there is a, an offset around the vent, um, well, where the vent's located relative to the properties to be uh, to be constructed. Is that because it, it was never brought up or is that because they've explicitly said one was not needed? That, that they they haven't raised any comments in that regard, but they if if even in in terms of if there were to be say a, a, a noise or vibration um, concern that they have um, from their monitoring and records, then that would be raised. But yes, no, they've not explicitly referenced air quality, but it hasn't been raised by the uh, the Envi council's environmental health uh, team as part of their kind of statutory obligations. Any further questions? Thank you, Mr. Abbott. Thank you. Before we move on to uh, questions for the planning officers, I'd just like the opportunity <coughs> to say that uh, the proceedings are focused on getting clarity about points that you are not sure of. Once we have done this, we can then have further discussion about the application based on what you've read and heard. For that reason, members, I would be grateful if you do not move any motions at this stage. Let's wait until we've had a chance to make our assessments. The same rules apply. Are there any questions for the uh, planning officers? Councillor Elliott, Councillor Armitage. Thank you, Chair. Uh, earlier, we, we heard one of the speakers make mention of the width of the roads and whether or not the access from uh, the dustbin lorries and so on would be a problem. I'm more thinking on the safety if the can get through. Can the ambulance? Uh, can Adrian or uh, Phil just give us a bit of a rundown on that one? Sorry, I, I missed some of the, uh, the the question chair through the through the, the break up. But essentially, the um, the Harrow Authority haven't raised an objection, and there are conditions with respect to um, to the visibility display. So um, we're satisfied in, in terms of the, the highway safety implications of the development. And, and Phil, also, the, not only did they mention about the the width of the lorries and coming out with egress access and uh, and entrance exit to the side they mentioned about the the road splay from clay from clay lane into the side there's some and if, if i recall something along the 24 meter line is there an issue with that as well 
Um, I, I can only reiterate what, what the highways have said, that they haven't raised an objection subject to, to conditions. So um, as far as we're aware, there, there isn't any issue with um, the development not being served by a safe and adequate site access. And just a little worried that if it is just a desktop survey, it needs probably a, a little more in-depth on-site survey, just, just to make sure that what we're, what we're looking at with this application is correct. It, it, it is conditioned that uh, they provide those visibility displays. So, it, so if in the event they can't provide those visibility displays, then they, they can't um, implement the development. So there is that, that caveat. Um, yes, I appreciate the frustration that due to COVID, highways aren't, aren't visiting sites, but um, like I say, from our point of view, with them not having raised an objection subject to conditions, uh, we're, we're confident that, um, that the visibility space can be achieved. Just if Thanks I add to that, to Chair, as well, on the drawings that have been submitted, the, the visibility displays have come to Clay Lane are demonstrated on there, Chair, which would give us uh, the confidence to recommend approval on that issue to members. Thanks, Adrian. Thank you. Councillor Armitage? Thank you, Chair. Uh, it was to do with the uh, hedge on the roadside that uh, it's proposed to take out. Uh, can you tell me why it's been taken out? And uh, the uh, off-road parking provision at that point, uh, what, uh, what provision has there been? Is there any uh, off-road parking uh, to the, uh, the houses on that side? I just start on that, uh, Chair, and then Phil might uh, might have something to add. But the I, I believe that Councillor Armitage is referring to the hedge along the road frontage, and some of that will obviously yeah. need to be taken out to afford access into the site. That's inevitable in terms of the site only site access being provided. That can only be provided to Clay Lane, so some of that hedge row will need to be taken out to afford that. In terms of the the affordable housing. As was discussed, I think earlier on, there is the affordable housing at the southwestern corner of the site, southwestern portion of the site, and the indicative landscaping scheme does show some roadside, road frontage, hedgerow being replanted along there. But of course, to accommodate the housing, then the roadside hedge, even in that area, would need to be taken out in the first instance. And Phil may be able to assist on this better than I, Chair, but. The, the site itself does provide sufficient on-site car parking in accordance with your normal standards to afford car parking for all the new houses that are proposed. Uh, if I could just come back to you, Adrian, before Phil comes in uh, with his comments, would it be possible, uh, if we were going to go forward with this plan to approve it, that we could sort the uh, flood problems out uh, once and for all and that uh, uh, the press brook could be cleaned out before they even start work. I think that that in my mind is something that's got to be done uh, and this mending of the sewer, sewers usually break uh, because of uh, subsidence. Now it's been mentioned about the coal authority and their uh, the things which they said well with modern sort of techniques and what have you in building you can put down a, a raft which will alleviate any problems but uh, even if you put uh, the sewer pipes around pea gravel and things like that uh, it, uh, it, it you can get problems with sewers breaking I mean if we're going to do this it's got to be done right before they start and I, I, I you know, I can't emphasise it more. Before, not when they're halfway on with it. Right. Thank you. Councillor Shipman and then Councillor Foster. I'll just come back to me in a second, Chair. Sorry. Don't you just address those points that Councillor Armitage has raised uh, yes, first, Chair? So, sorry. Yeah, Phil was meant to be coming back about the uh, the hedge and road 
it was about the car park, and I believe. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can see from from the layout that um, that there is a mix of car parking solutions, but but um, they've all got on on plot parking. Um, the majority have got um, two spaces, and uh, there are garages as well. So um, we're, we're we're satisfied that it complies with successful places in terms of the um, in terms of the car parking arrangements. Uh, and also in terms of there being a mix of car parking, you know, frontage and down the side and, and garages. Just on the uh, the flooding issues that um, Councillor Armitage has raised again, Chair, if I, if I may, uh, Mr Abbott's I think explained that in some great detail to members and it's difficult to add to that. But just to emphasise that the issues that are ongoing at the moment are ongoing issues and the reasons for that I think have been discussed in some detail. And the scheme that is proposed, Chair, will leave the necessary buffers between the development and the brook to allow future maintenance as appropriate through the application site, if that is what is necessary, Chair. And in terms of the future foul land surface water runoff, again, as Mr Abbott explained, that would all be dealt with on site. And in terms of the surface water, that would be tanked initially and then let into the brook at an appropriate rate, such that the site itself shouldn't exceed its current greenfield runoff in any case. So there shouldn't be any additional flooding impact from this site than as existing. And that's clear, Chair, that the technical consultees on this have been very clear and raised no objections. And... I've not heard anything this afternoon that would suggest to me that there is evidence to suggest that those conclusions are wrong in this case. Thanks. These are all very theoretical, Adrian, and I've seen all this before. And, and it is mentioned about a management company. Well, these companies come and go. And what happens if the management company goes bust? I mean, uh, what uh, backup is there? Uh, you know, it, it's all very, very theoretical. And if we, as soon as we get a big downpour, that poor chap in the uh, uh, level three is going to get flooded out, and he should be protected before any of this starts. And this was my thing about let's have the actual level of Pressbrook dropped. We've got these problems in in and around Ashover. And I've always, I know where they all are, and I make sure that they're all, all the ditches and drains are, are kept clear. And, you know, I think it's, well, local councillors need to be aware of where the pinch points are and make sure that they are kept clear. And, you know, that's just my point. It's all very theoretical until it rains. Thank you. Councillor Shipman. Thanks, Chair. I just wanted to could clear something up for me, Adrian. In the um, report, it says the NEDDC engineers have commented uh, that the management of the surface water from the development, a lack of consideration has been given to incorporation of suds features. Additional details will be required before the method of surface water disposal can be uh, considered. Can you just explain to me what that means if it doesn't mean that what's been proposed has been um, as a lack of consideration. I, I can come in there if you want, uh, Chair. Um, the, the comments from our street scenes were the comments when the application was initially submitted. The, um, the, the level of detail and application has moved on quite considerably since then, and they were reconsulted on the information, but we haven't had any further comments on them. So those comments were taken at a, at a point of time. But, well, isn't that quite misleading in the report? Then? Because it, why are we not getting the up-to-date information? Because to me, before it comes before committee, given that we know flooding is a massive issue here on this one, that we've not got the up-to-date assessment from any DDC engineers before it's even come before us, because it seems to me like we're, we're being asked to make decisions blindfolded, whilst trying to rely on private consult, uh, consultants on flooding issues. Uh, I, I respectfully disagree with that, because we've um, consulted the Derbyshire flood team, which are the lead local flood authority. So, so in effect, the, the engineers and the, and the flood authority are commenting on on the same the, the same things. So it's not a private individual relying on relying on the Derbyshire County Council as the statutory consultee. 
Uh, so what we're saying is the NEDDC engineers have submitted uh, opposing comments or differing comments from the leading flood authority that are commenting on the same issue. Uh, now, what we're saying is we haven't got up to date comments from NEDDC, but we have got up to date comments from uh, the Derbyshire flood team. We have been right, just, them. just uh, sorry, Phil. It, it's fine as you come in. It's fine. I was just going to to say on that issue, Chair, that we seek the advice of various bodies, and as Phil quite rightly says, the lead flood authority are the primary flood agency as their name suggests and that's the advice that we would normally rely on clearly if we get advice from our own engineers we can take that into account as well however chair as, as phil's also said work's gone on on this issue of flooding over the time of the application and the most up-to-date information has been assessed by the lead flood authority on that basis and i'd urge members to consider very carefully what the technical expertise as outlined in this case and indeed what's been submitted by the applicant's own flood advisors and their own service water advisors and to reiterate chair i appreciate and understand members have been asked to consider this matter but there's an existing situation in respect of flooding in and around the site and that won't change if the site is developed or not but what, as is always the case, Chair, is that we are asked to ensure that new development does make an existing does not make an existing situation worse. And the information that we have before us as officers and which we reported to members satisfies us that that is the case in this instance and that the site could be satisfactorily developed for the number of houses proposed without adding to the flooding problems that may exist at the moment in and around the site, Chair and without any technical evidence to override that and again i've not heard anything this afternoon that is technical evidence to override that information without that other evidence or other information chair i'd ask members to very seriously consider the matter and the evidence that you do have before you in making your decision this afternoon thank you can i just have one more question chair is that all right very quick it, it was it was on the fact that the I touched on it earlier that the, the latest application is for 34 homes, I believe, and the the new local plan, which incorporates a spit of land, says 25. Have you gone back to the developer and and, and said, well, look, this is the local plan in the emerging, uh, this is the plan in the local uh, the emerging local plan. Why are you not going for 25? Because that's what we've we've agreed as a council it's suitable at that point and then you could actually move it around the site move the houses around the site to make this flooding issue less prominent. and what's been the response from the developer on that is, is that something that they consider okay Jeff, if i may just before phil comes in on the, um, the negotiation that he'll be able to advise on um, as councillor shipman points out that the site is a, an allocation in your publication draft local plan which we as officers in our report to members are uh, suggesting that significant weight should be attached to which is which is a, a high level of weight in terms of the scaling and the wording in the publication draft local plan is to deliver approximately 25 dwellings it doesn't set out 25 dwellings per se and therefore it doesn't prevent members in making a decision this afternoon to permit a number greater than or in other circumstances perhaps less than but it doesn't say that the site should be developed for 25 houses full stop it says approximately 25 houses and, and as i say chair phil may be able to uh, discuss any negotiations he's had with the developers over numbers but hope that uh, helps with the local planning position chair yeah Councilor yeah. don't want to come in chair and um, council shipman uh, yes, please. Sorry, Mark. Okay. There eventually. Yeah. Um, yes, there have been discussions with, with with the agent with regard to the scheme and and on the issue of of the numbers and and the allocation. But as as Adrian says, there is no upper number. It is an, an estimated um, amount. And in terms of the garden sizes, they all comply with successful places. So it's not um, overdevelopment as such. Um, and also. There's been no objections from the Wildlife Trust on the uh, ecology issues or the, the, the flood team in, in terms of the flooding issues. So um, the, 
the the, um, the scheme in front of you is what the what the applicants have put forward. We, we didn't feel that we were able to um, to recommend re refusal of it on the basis of the local plan allocation. Thank you. Councillor Foster. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, uh, perhaps what I'm looking for here is some clarity from Mr. Slater and Mr. Kirkham on uh, on, on the on the flood issue. And it's uh, that's that's my main concern about this application. What concerns me is I've heard so much already here from uh, local residents and from local councillors about all the flooding problems, and I've heard an awful lot from the professional side and from the lead local flood authority. So we've heard a, a lot about the flooding and the historical flooding from objectors and these local people that are against this, speaking against this. But against that, we've got a flood risk assessment and a drainage strategy that raises no issues. So, so what I'm looking for is some clarity on this. Uh, in addition, we've got the Environment Agency and Lead Local Flood Authority, which raise no issues. That's on that. And then when we look at the combined sewer, uh, which is in the documentation, we're told it will struggle, but at the same time, seven Trent have already reported that the flow will easily accommodate 38 dwellings and uh, the, the flow from the 38 dwellings, and it's relatively low and it can be accommodated. That's seven Trent. They've confirmed that the existing sewer can service the new houses. And we've also heard that part of the site from residents here, <clears throat> part of the site is in flood zone three. And yet the environment agency are confirming that it's all in zone one. So what I'm looking at is all this information I've heard from residents, uh, which if we're not careful, that could be hearsay. Yeah, it could be. Now we take people on face value and we do when we hear people speak here, we do do that. But at the same time, we've got professional reports We've got the Environment Agency, Lead Local Flood Authority, Seven Trent uh, County, and all saying something different. So I, I want to be careful here where I put my, uh, you know, what, you know, what judgment to make and what way to put on what reports. So I'm looking for some clarity in that. Uh, in that, apart from what people have said here, when it comes to flooding, are there any? Do we have any professional reports? or any any sort of report at all that's uh, by an engineer that says there is going to be flooding here. And that's a question to our officers. Anything that says this flooding is going to happen, apart from, you know, uh, what could be hearsay. Chair, I don't know if Nikki can, can hear this, but on the, <coughs> excuse me, on the flood zone issue, if we could just have the presentation of the plan that Phil went through earlier on, Chair, does show clearly where the flood zones are and that may be the easiest way of addressing that issue it's it's, it's up quite a few nick if you can go back almost to the start please just up a little bit further and that's that's the one there where you cursor it that's the one yes so that's where the um flood zones are chair and to my reading of that it shows quite clearly to me that this site doesn't fall within a flood zone two or a flood zone three. So therefore the comments that Mr. Abbott made earlier on about the flood zones is correct from the data and the information that we have from the um, envir environment agency and the others who provide this information. Thanks, Nikki, that, that's really helpful, thank you. Just in terms of the, the other issues, Councillor Foster is correct, Chair, that we, as a determining body you need to look at the evidence that you have on this technical matter and you shouldn't rely on unevidenced background or or stories that can't be substantiated or other comments that have been made to you the evidence that we have is from the professional bodies that the applicant has asked to consider the matter and they've submitted their evidence to the council in terms of the flood risk assessment that they've done and the scheme that they've put forward to address the issue of on-site surface water chair and that's been then professionally assessed by the lead local flood authority and the other bodies as well seven trent yorkshire water etc they've all looked at that and then they've come to their conclusion on that and their own understanding and information and concluded that there is no reason to object to this application on the technical issue of flooding chair and also you've heard a lot this afternoon in respect of the 
foul situation, the Seven Trent situation with regards to the sewerage situation and how their capacity would be put in place to allow for the proper drainage of the site, the dwellings proposed. That is, as far as I'm aware, and unless I'm misunderstanding the situation, that is the professional advice that we have, and that's all we have. The other information that you've heard this afternoon is from those who live close to the site, and, and as officers, we're not saying that there isn't an issue for those other houses that fall the other side of the press book. But what we're saying to you as officers, Chair, is that the evidence we have and we've put forward shows to us that the expertise identifies that this site itself should not add to that surface water or foul water disposal situation that the site can be adequately drained in respect of that chair. And I, again, I reiterate, I've not heard any substantive evidence this afternoon that would lead me to a different conclusion. Hoping that's clear enough for, for Council. That's, Foster, that's clear yeah. enough, thank you. Thank you, Mr Kirkham. Thank you. Any further questions? Councillor Armitage, then we really must move on. Thank you for your forbearance, Chair. Uh, yeah, it, it, it's this uh, drainage situation that we've got. Yes, you, I, I'm, I'm speaking as a professional here. I've been trained and I've done various drainage jobs uh, on and around a farm. And it can be overcome, but you have to go from basic principles to start with. And the first thing is you've got to clean the dike, the uh, press brook out. That's to be cleaned out first, and then you put a complete drainage system into that, uh, into the uh, brook, and you have to make sure it'll take it, not flood the poor chap out who said he's in uh, uh, number, what was it, flood range three, uh, and that's got to be taken into consideration. So that brook is a top priority to be done, and this should be done before any work is carried out. And if we go back to the new local plan, this was put forward by the previous administration and there was no uh, objection to this site by any member on that thing. It went out to consultation and there had been no objection to the site whatsoever. So if there had been a, a local plan, a neighbourhood plan in place, then you could have... Uh, talked about it better and had a stronger case. The trouble is at the moment, we've got this uh, local plan, which is emerging. An agent said we put great uh, weight should be put on it. But we've had two uh, conflicting reports from two different inspectors. One said no weight should be put on it. And another one said uh, that we should look at the old one and the other one said that we should put great weight on it. So, Adrian, how much weight do we put on this local plan, considering there's no neighbourhood plan, which we have in other areas? Just on, on the first point again, Chair, it's, it's difficult to, to say anything new about the issue of flooding than, than I've already said. But just to reiterate what I discussed with Councillor Foster a few minutes ago, Chair, the evidence that I have seen leads me to conclude that in terms of this site it will not add to a flooding problem chair and in addressing the issues that have been raised you have to be proportionate in terms of the development that is proposed and you shouldn't be seeking to impose unnecessary or disproportionate requirements on the developer of this site chair and with the buffer zone that's been left and as officers we believe that appropriate maintenance of the brook could take place should you grant consent for the housing development this afternoon chair just in terms of the the local plan again as i've said a number of times to members chair it is for you as a planning committee to determine what weight you believe is appropriate to the publication draft local plan in our report as officers we've taken a view that because of the level that the new local plan has now achieved it's that it's consultation on the main modifications as officers we've taken a view that that should then attract significant weight which is going to the top end of the the weight that we believe you should attach which is not full weight but it's achieving that significant level of weight now and as has been discussed the site is a draft allocation in that plan 
and therefore in our recommendation chair we place significant weight on that allocation in bringing forward our recommendation to you in terms of the, the various issues that council Armitage says about inspectors decisions you may get a chance to discuss the, the most recent later on this afternoon chair if time allows us and yes we do have some difference of difference of opinion between inspectors over a number of appeals over the past few um, appeals that we've received on these larger housing sites however the, the principle still remains chair that you must start with your development plan and decisions must follow on from that and in your development plan as it stands extant development plan the site is in the countryside however as we've discussed previously there is um, a level of uncertainty about how much weight you can rely on purely and simply that the site lies outside settlement limits and therefore chair in our recommendation to members in placing that significant weight on the emerging plan that does add significant weight as as is suggested in what i've just said to that so that's led us on on bringing together all those issues that's led us to recommend approval of the scheme to members chair placing significant weight on your publication draft local plan thank you are there any further questions other than flooding that the members want to address no okay thank you very much officers um we can move on to the next part um again we this is where we can open the floor for debate and i would please ask that you refrain from moving any motions until everyone has concluded their discussions. Uh, with that, colleagues, the floor is open. Excuse me, Chair, would it be helpful if at this point I was to um, go oh, through yes, the you rules your piece, Alan. Yes, Chair. please right, do. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, please bear in mind, members, that a motion must be moved and seconded before a vote is taken. If an amendment to a motion is moved and seconded, then that motion will be voted on for, or that amendment will be voted on first. If a motion is to be moved, which goes against the officer recommendations, then the member who has moved the motion must give the reasons for doing so. The reasons for moving a motion against officer recommendations should comprise the relevant planning issues and be supported by evidence as necessary. If a motion to reject officer recommendations fails, or in other words, it is not passed, that doesn't mean that the recommendations are automatically approved. Rather, you will need to take a positive decision through a further motion in favour of the recommendations or another course of action. This will need to be approved by the committee through another vote. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I'm going to open the floor for debate. Councillor Armitage. Right, unmuted. Uh, well, I think most people have uh, heard my arguments uh, for and against this uh, thing, this uh, application. The problem is that uh, if it were to go to appeal, uh, I think the uh, was the weight of argument uh, by the experts would uh, make the uh, inspector find in favour of the uh, applicant and uh, no doubt would land us with a large bill. Uh, and that's my honest opinion. Uh, I, on, uh, you know, I mean, we've got to put various conditions on before they start work especially with the drainage. That's my point of view. Anyone else? Councillor Foster? Yeah, um, I'm afraid I'm much the same as Councillor Armitage in that I can see all the feeling against this and I can see all the people that have objected, but I've not heard anything yet that shows that this committee can actually uh, properly uh reject this uh this application for planning permission uh, at all uh flooding is the main issue and i've had all my questions answered when it comes to my my concerns about flooding i have um and uh, my concern is for 
it's not just for this actual application it's it's for you know it's it's for the council at the end of the day uh, this will go to appeal and do you know uh i don't see uh, there's uh, there's there's any way we can uh, we can say they will be flooding there based on all those all those reports so i'm pretty much the same that's my view thank you any other view councillor shipman yeah um i have to, i have to disagree that there's plenty of things that this can be objected on not least because the allocation of housing is higher than what's in the emerging local plan and the fact that the existing local plan doesn't have the site in whatsoever so one the uh i'll see one at least in the new one you could object i'm struggling with the sustainable aspect given the how tight the roads are around there and the lack of infrastructure investment in especially the flooding issue which we're saying there's not one but ultimately we can request that something's done to that if if, if that's the condition we want to put on it um but I, I, I think that the main issues for me is a there's an event on site, and I thought if it's if there's a motion forward to approve this, one of the conditions needs to be a pollution assessment, surely. Um, then, then there's I think more work needs to be done around the flooding, because whilst consultants are really good at bringing us reports with what the developer wants, I, I, we've seen firsthand on developments throughout this district where Derbyshire County Council will say nothing. That's not necessarily that they agree with the proposal. That's that they have no comments on the proposal. So if they don't think about an aspect that we thought about in committee, that will come up in the appeal that we could perfectly argue. And I think that, that given the housing allocation is 36% more than what we've got allocated in the emerging local plan, that alone could reject this, this proposal. And that's how I'm going to be voting today. I just think there's too many houses for that small plot of land. Clearly, the discussions have already been added in the local plan process on why it hasn't been higher than 25. I mean, to say the number 34 is even remotely approximate to the number 25 when it's such a small development is that's just not correct. Clearly, 36% increase, increase in houses is a huge amount more on a, a plot that we've already allocated. So, you know, if, if no one else has got anything else to say, uh, I'm ready to propose a motion, if that's okay, Chair. But I'll leave that with you to let me know when. Anybody else, any comments to make? Can I just say that I agree with uh, Councillor Shipman? I think looking at the local plan as it is, it's not even meant to be in there. And I think the, we're already oversubscribed for housing in Claycross. This is a small piece of land. It's the only bit of greenery that's going to be left around that area. And I think it should be left intact. I think the flooding will come to light very quickly. Mm -hmm. We're in the winter months. The rain's going to start coming down heavier. And I think you'll soon find out if we put extra houses on there, that the ones at the lower end of the, uh, the development will be the ones that will be flooding and going into the ones that sit down below them. So I'm, I'm with uh, Councillor Ross Shipman. Any further comment? Councillor Foster? Yeah, all those last comments all sound fine, but they're not real reasons for rejecting this at all. None of those. Okay, um, where are we now? Having heard everything that's at oh, Councillor Armitage? Oh. oh. Yes, uh, got the beat now. Adrian. Sorry. William, carry on. Okay, thank you. Uh, can I move to go with officer's recommendation? Can I just uh, ask uh, Adrian Kirkham to come in at this point before we move the motion? There was just one point, Chair, about housing numbers that um, has been raised. And as, as we've discussed again many times, the level of housing numbers is never an upper limit. And you're always permitted to, to grant more than the level of housing that's proposed, Chair. So the fact that there are housing coming forward in and around Clay Cross and elsewhere wouldn't preclude you per se from granting consent for an additional number of houses chair and I hear what uh, Councillor Shipman says but if otherwise the site can appropriately accommodate the numbers proposed chair that wouldn't in itself in your officer's view be a reason to refuse the application. Thank, Thank you, you. Thank you. Councillor Foster? 
Yeah, uh, I'd happy second uh, Councillor Armitage's um, uh, motion uh, to go with officers' recommendations. Um, again, we need real reasons to be able to reject something like this. It's not hearsay, and it's not because we don't want it. You've got to have real reasons, and I haven't heard any. Um, and that's based on what I've heard from all sides, and uh, especially based on what I've heard from officers. Thank you. Uh, I just want to clarify something with our clerk. Alan, I believe Councillor Shipman did put in a motion to start with before anybody else. Uh, there hasn't actually been a motion which is approved and seconded other than, as I understand it, they're the one from Councillor Armitage and Councillor Foster. Chair, can I just make a point of order? The only reason we got to that situation was because I respected the request from you not to put any motions yeah. forward. Until yeah, motion. exactly. And therefore, I didn't get anyone to second it because of that reason. You can't then have someone propose and second a motion straight after giving that. I'm just giving you that case. Yeah, yeah, that's why I wanted clarification, Councillor Shipman. Councillor Foster? Yeah, I understand Councillor Shipman's point, but the uh, fact of the matter is, there is still only one motion which has been proposed and seconded. It might have been somebody's intention to hold back and all the rest of it, and it might be somebody, somebody else's intention now to second that motion. But as it stands, there is still only one motion which has been proposed and seconded, and it couldn't be any clearer. There's one motion currently. Thank you. Councillor Armitage? I'd just like to make the point that this new local plan, uh, I was on the steering committee for this, and when it was, uh, then this site was brought up, there were no objectors to it. And it's all right coming now and objecting to it, but you know, it's too far on. Thank you. Right, I'm going back to the clerk now, Alan. Yes, Chair. I mean, I think as things stand, it's obviously a matter of the Chair's discretion ultimately, but you do have a motion before you, which is to um, go for officer or rather to approve officer recommendations. All I can simply say, that is the motion which is before you. OK, thank you. Right. Can I ask Councillor Armitage to put his motion through properly? This, uh, you know, go through it so everyone is clear and then I'll ask Councillor Foster if he still wishes to second it. Yes, chair. It was to approve the. Uh, it was to approve the uh, uh, the uh, uh, planning application, and to go with the officer's recommendation on it. Thank you, Councillor Foster. I'm happy to second that, and I think it's uh, it's the right decision. It's the only one we can make. Uh, it goes with officers' recommendations, and it follows all professional reports and advice. There is nothing else. Thank you. Thank you. Can I now have a show of hands? Uh, just before you do that, I just want to be clear, uh, Chair, uh, does uh, the planning manager uh, have any comments before we move to the vote? Um, no, Chair, as far as I'm aware, the uh, the motion is as per officer recommendation, Chair, and I'm uh, comfortable um, okay. taking the vote. Uh, Alan, thank you. Thank you. Can I now have a show of hands? So are we uh, going to actually do this by roll call? Uh, we can do. Yep. Are you uh, okay with that, Nikki? Yes, of course, Chair. So as is normal practice now for virtual planning meetings, we will uh, take the vote by roll call in alphabetical order. If you could clearly state for, against, where abstain. Councillor Armitage. For. Councillor Barry. Against. Councillor Cooper. Abstain. Councillor Elliott. For. Councillor Foster. Four. Councillor Huckabee. I'm just going to give you a prompt to unmute, Councillor Huckabee. Councillor Huckabee, are you able to unmute and just indicate for or against or abstain? Four. Thank you, Councillor Huckabee. Councillor Potts. Four. Councillor Powell. Four. Councillor Ridgeway. Against. Councillor Rouse. Against. Councillor Ruff. Four. And Councillor Shipman. Against. Chair, I make that seven votes for, four against, 
with one abstention, which means the uh, the motion is carried to grant um, along with officer recommendations subject to the section 106. Thank you very much. Thank you, members, and thank you any speakers that are remaining. Uh, we up to three o'clock. So do we want to take a break now or move on to the second one? A break now. OK, I say 10 minutes. OK, so we'll be back here at five past three. Five past three. Thank you, Chair.
next planning application, which is reference number two zero forward slash zero zero four zero nine forward slash RM. This is rever reserved matters application for 180 dwellings, including details of layout, appearance, and landscaping, percent to 17 forward slash 00268 forward slash OL. Um, before I go on to um, ask for the presentation from the officers, <clears throat> I'd just like to remind you all that the access point and the number of dwellings has already been determined. So this isn't the ideal place or should not be the place for any debate about such matters. They have already been determined at appeal by the inspectorate. Thank you. So the, I have here, the report is going to be given by Adrian Kirkham. That's correct, Chair, yeah, yes, whenever you're ready. Off you go, thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Before we get on to the presentation, I have a couple of late updates to bring to members and also a brief introduction. So if members can bear with me, please. But firstly, Chair, just to draw members' attention to the late updates report that was circulated yesterday. And in addition, Chair, We've received a letter confirming that Yorkshire Water has no objections to the scheme. We've also received a further letter of representation from the applicant's agent, Mr Hill, who will address you shortly, I believe. He sets out a few points uh, as follows, Chair. The sweat path analysis has been completed in conjunction with council officers to ensure that refuse vehicles can access all areas of the site. The road spurs referred to in correspondence will either not be offered for adoption or have been included to allow for proper refuse collection purposes. The design amendments made address the comments of the police. The urban design comments are noted, but further amendments would reduce amenity areas to houses and connectivity. And Chair, the landscape areas will be managed by an appointed management company with native trees, trees being predominant in the public areas, including at the site entrance, with other more appropriate species planted where they're closer to built development. And on the merits of the scheme, Chair, the applicant's agent states that the road network has been designed to the satisfaction of the Refuse Service and the Highway Authority. And as you've just mentioned, the outline approval addressed issues in respect to the character of the development, its impact on the area, and specifically its scale and the issue of access. During subsequent discussions, Chair, with officers, further amendments have been made to increase the density of the development at its centre, decreasing it towards the perimeter of the site, allowing for soft edge, enabling it to integrate into the area. It is similar in density to the area of housing to the south, retains area of open space along the southern and western edges in particular. Additionally, Chair, the outline consent imposes conditions that will require other features, including wheel washing, to enable on-site construction to be undertaken sympathetically. Overall, Chair, the applicant's agent considers a scheme of a high quality, sympathetic and asset to the area. It includes 40% much needed affordable housing, public open space, a play area and public art. And he doesn't consider there are any technical reasons to resist the development. And so no reasons why members should not feel able to support it, Chair. Just in terms of the, the application itself, before I come on to the presentation, Chair, seeking consent for the three reserved matters of layout, appearance and landscaping further to the granting of outline planning consent, as you've already mentioned, in November 2018. As such, Chair, and to reiterate the points you've made, the considerations in this case are limited to those issues only and the other minor issues that are referred to in the officer report. And for clarity, the issue of the principle of development of the site and matters relating to its access and scale are not open for consideration by the Planning Committee this afternoon, Chair. The application is seeking consent for 180 dwellings will be two storey in scale saved for those along the northern site boundary, which will be one and a half storeys high as required by the outline consent granted. And 40% of the units will be affordable with one quarter of those as socially rented housing. The site occupies in addition to the east of Wingworth and it borders countryside. It comprises, chairs we'll see in the photograph shortly, two fields with a central hedgerow tree spine. It's bounded to a large extent by trees and hedgerows and slopes gradually north to south. Access to it will be taken off Spindle Drive to the south. Members will note there aren't any technical objections to the scheme. Officers have entered into discussions with the applicant over the details of it. 
and the suggestions put forward by officers and how the scheme could be improved in design terms have generally been accepted and well received by the applicant and amendments made. It's resulted, Chair, in a scheme that officers believe offers a high standard of design with a clear site gateway, feature buildings at key points, generally good boundary treatments, an outward facing design, the celebration of key features such as trees, and the general retention of trees and hedgerows. Officers also consider, Chair, it creates a legible design with good access within and around the site. The only area that remained unresolved was to the northern boundary, where due to site levels and the need to form the block structure of the, of the development, the units will not face outwards. However, Chair, even here, the applicants have agreed to implement a green fence along the most prominent part of the site, such that it will soften, soften this boundary. The associated issues of affordable housing, climate change, and landscape ecological management were all considered satisfactory too, Chair. And in conclusion, officers consider the scheme a good design solution for the site and recommend that the application is approved in accordance with the recommendation on page 85 of your report, Chair. If I can just ask uh, Nikki to bring up the presentation, I'll just go through the, the various slides. We've got a number of photographs, Chair, that hopefully illustrate some of the points that I've made. But this is the application site, and this is the drawing that is contained in your papers, Chair. It comes out better on this slide than in your paper, so I apologise for the poor quality of that. But it does show access to the south, taken from the existing Spindle Drive and then accessing onto Deerlands Road. And as I've mentioned, Chair, that point of access has been agreed and approved by the inspector on appeal back in 2018 and isn't a matter for consideration by you this afternoon. The, the scheme is set out there, Chair, the amended scheme. And as I've mentioned, it provides an officer opinion, a good design solution for the site. The areas to the west and the south in particular offer good open areas of space with retention of trees and hedgerows. There are gateway buildings, a block structure, and as you can see, the central spine of the hedgerow within the site is being retained and will form, I mean, in officer opinion, an attractive walkway through the development. There are footways around or within the site, except to the northern boundary and a little bit of the northeastern area of the site, Chair, but otherwise good access within and around the site. And this is a coloured up drawing showing roughly where the existing trees there in the, the darker colours and the lighter trees there in the lighter colours will be formed. The only area where there is some retaining issues to be considered and discussed is in the southwest, southeastern corner share where the attenuation basin is. And we just need to bring, to get, bring together the ecological and landscaping imperatives that we've set out with the need to provide that appropriate surface water um, attenuation basin and that is therefore conditioned as per one of the recommended conditions chair thanks nikki in the um, line aa and bb and as you can see at the top line that exemplifies the point i've made about the entrance into the site with the rendered finish of those buildings which turn the corner into the site and officers believe correct Thanks, Nikki. The top two lines here show the one and a half storey units on the northern boundary of the site, again using different materials to create those focal points and areas of interest. Also, chair within the site is a good use of boundary features and particularly um, estate railings to create some nodal points and again the areas of interest and legibility throughout the site. Thanks, Nikki. Uh, the next few slides, Chair, I'll ask Nikki to uh, just move through these relatively quickly, but they show some of the house types. Um, there are various two-storey units, but with additional features on the gable ends as appropriate, Chair, and then the use of render, again, as I've discussed. And these ones show the one and a half storey units that will occupy the northern site boundary. And finally, Chair, the, the photographs. This is the, um, taken from the close to the entrance onto Spindle Drive with Deerlands Road. So this first portion of the roadway here would be used to access the site. And you can just make out a car in the centre right of the photograph 
roughly opposite there would be where the access point would divert off the existing spindle drive and then go through the, the hedgerow that you can see there over a, a bridge over the brook and into the site proper. And the next slide, Nikki will show a closer up point of that particular position. So the access will go roughly in this location, forming an entrance point through that hedgerow. And then we're going to the far southeastern corner of the site. Now, these are some pictures along the uh, Trickett Brook and show how the brook is well vegetated, creating that um, very attractive boundary to the site. So the tree line there is along the brook and all that vegetation except where the access would be formed would be retained and form a backdrop for the site. And these photographs go back up towards the, the site access, showing how that feature will be integrated into the site, save the access going through it. Thanks, Nikki. And that's again back to that point looking in the other direction. The houses on the far left are those on Dearlands Road. And we're I'm going up Hockley Lane here and the feature trees on the right will be retained. And this seeks to show chair that Hockley Lane is generally um, it is a it is a public right of way. It's not to be used as part of the development of the site um, and it will be retained in roughly this form with a hedgerow and the hedgerow trees being retained. Thanks, Nikki. And now on to the, the site proper chair. The large tree that's to the left of the photograph forms the tree in the northwestern boundary of the site. That's in the hedgerow with Hockley Lane. The houses beyond the hedgerow to the right, those currently being constructed off Hockley Lane. And then the houses, the bungalows to the far left of the photograph are older units that um, form part of the, the village of Wingworth previously and then Hockley Lane in between there. But the field in the immediate forefront of the photograph doesn't form part of the site. The site boundary is formed by that tree I've mentioned, following down Hockley Lane and then coming across the field to the left. Thanks, Nikki. This is looking from roughly that same point, but in this photograph, you've got Hockley Lane and the hedgerow and the trees on the far right. And you've got, you can just make out in the, the murky distance, those are uh, houses that form the developed off Spindle Drive. So you can see the, the hedgerow and the trees that run along Trickett Brook. And then the hedgerow on the left is the hedgerow that will form the central spine of the site, with that being retained and forming, um, in office opinion, an attractive walkway through the development. So the site boundary is roughly in the hedge that, uh, sorry, in the fence that runs from the left hand side of the photograph across to the middle right of the photograph. Thanks, Nikki. This is taken from a, a similar vantage point, but that hedge now is the central point of the site. So we've moved slightly to the east, looking down again towards the south. Thanks, Nikki. And similarly, the, the hedge row there with the houses off Spindle Drive to the far right the photograph. Thank you. This is now looking along the northern boundary. There is um, some hedgerow, some tree features along there. But, uh, it is rather a disparate hedge and um, tree um, belt that forms that boundary, but that will be um, formed of those houses that are mentioned, the one and a half storey units. The tree that you can see roughly in the mid right of the photograph will have some closer views of that in a second, but that is the tree that would be retained in an area of public open space and, as I've mentioned, celebrated at the end of one of those runs of housing at the end of the, the street to provide a focal point and the, the applicants have worked with us to ensure that is an integral part of the scheme. Thanks, Nikki. And we're now on the eastern boundary and that's the tree that will be retained within that area of space. You can see the remainder of the site to the right, that's the other field beyond the, the central spine hedgerow. And just in the far distance, you can see the other houses that occupy the land off Spindle Drive. Thanks, Nikki. And then this is looking from that point back across the site. You can see the hedgerow I've talked to quite a bit about in the, the middle of that photograph, and then the houses to the far left there, existing unit Spindle Drive and others. Thank you. Looking back along the, the northern boundary, that would foot that uh, hedge line, tree line would form the northern boundary of the site. And as you can see, the levels rise 
relatively steeply at that point compared with the rest of the site. And they would be this one and a half story units along that boundary in accordance with the requirements of the outline consent. Thanks, Nikki. This is back towards the, uh, the central spine hedgerow, that's on the right hand side. You can see the houses off Spindle Drive in the middle distance with the Trickett Brook line of trees and hedges just in front of there. Thank you. And a similar um, shot chair back down across the field towards the, the south of the site. Thank you. And that's looking uh, back across the, the, the northern boundary of the site, back from where you've come from. The, uh, the tree that I keep on mentioning is that one on the far right. Thank you. And similar views now, Chair, the, the hedgerow on the left hand side, the field in the, uh, the foreground, and then Hockley Lane, the boundary Hockley Lane on the far right. Just getting back to where we started, the tree on the left hand side is that one that's on the, the northwestern boundary of the site. Looking back down that central spine hedgerow, there's just one or two more, I think, Nikki. This is the final slide. This is back on Hockley Lane. Hockley Lane goes off to the right. And this is just an indication of the development that's taking place on the other side of Hockley Lane from the site. So the application site to the right hand side of Hockley Lane development uh, that's under construction on the left hand side there. And it's set showing the, the setback from the site boundary, which will be mirrored on the development site itself. The only difference being that on the application site, there will only be a private drive between Hockley Lane and the houses, whereas on the development you can see there, that is a road to an adoptable standard, so is more engineered and a deeper setback. But the new development that we're considering this afternoon would have a setback, not as deep as that, but will be similar to that to the other side of Hockley Lane. I think that's it, Nikki. thank you. Thank you. Are there any points of clarification at this point before we move on to the speakers? No? Thank you. We'll move on to the first speaker, which is Councillor Barry Lewis. Is Councillor Lewis here? Ah, yes. I'm here. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you, uh, Chairman and uh, members of the Planning Committee for giving me a um, a few minutes to uh, to talk about this particular uh, application. We have all heard that it's already been through an appeal, um, which was uh, um, which was lost sadly, and uh, we are now looking at a 180 house uh, development uh, here. So there's not much we can do about the main access, but perhaps there are things that we can do to address some uh, some some other issues. I've often spoke of the uh, the scale and number of developments around Wingerworth being unsustainable and impactful on the uh, on the village. And, uh, and it is now looking increasingly overdeveloped. So that is a concern, I think, for, uh, for all of us. Um, this is also a very significant um, large green space within the village. But to get to matters that really sort of uh, matter and will hopefully help with the, uh, um, the overall process that we're dealing with here today, um, and that is to tackle some of the things about the internal layouts and uh, and ensure that uh, um, that they that they meet uh, meet need and fit for purpose uh, for the village uh, basically and um, i understand that uh, Rippenholm have a good reputation uh, generally for meeting their obligations around affordable uh, housing and uh, have done so uh, with regard to this particular site so i do at least welcome that i would however welcome the uh, the opportunity to have conversations with uh, rip and homes about improving things about uh, the internal layout making sure it meets its biodiversity obligations with regard to this site. Um, welcome, welcome to hear that uh, many of those hedgerows will be retained. But there are a couple of perhaps crucial aspects which we may need to consider. Um, nowadays, um, applications of this nature and scale should really be considering um, looking at not just bricks and mortar, which this one seems to be, uh, but look at development that is uh, lower carbon um, in the future. And this is a future development, and perhaps we should uh, be pressing that and looking at things like uh, uh, micro generation as well to reduce the electricity burden on the, both the national grid, but also to provide a greener alternative to lighting and heating uh, within those homes. Um, opportunities as well for ensuring that we have electric vehicle charging points as uh, standard for most of these sorts of uh, um, houses should be discussed and broadband is a massively important issue and we have we know we've had problems in parts of uh, Wingerworth in the past we should consider broadband as being something that uh, 
uh, as equally as important as having a water supply to one's home or electricity to supply and therefore consider um, that uh, uh, opening a conversation. I would be, in fact, welcoming of a conversation with uh, Ripon Homes to ensure that uh, we can in, uh, uh, sort of get the best deal that we can out of this particular site. Seconds in regards, remaining. Thank you. In regards to uh, uh, this particular site, so that we can maximise the opportunity both for Wingerworth um, currently, but also for future residents that will be utilising this site. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Are there any questions? No, thank you, Councillor. Our next speaker is Tony Carter. Mr. Carter? Yes, I'm, uh, yes, I'm here now. Hello. It's a long time for waiting. <laughs> right. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak about this. I represent, uh, I speak from a person who's got a boundary with the site, uh, but I know that what I'm saying uh, is represented by a lot of other people who would prefer not to speak personally. The the issues about uh, entry to the site, I know have been con discussed and we're not supposed to discuss those at all uh, because it's all been decided, but since the inquiry two years ago, uh, the amount of traffic has improved, increased greatly and no access, no allowance was made for the extra uh, houses that uh, Stancliffe are just uh, building opposite. And may I say at this point that uh, the picture of access from Hockley Lane onto the Stancliffe, that's to say Hockley Garden site, that is only being used for the purposes of the builders. It will not be used by the people there. They will have to have access uh, through Nether Close and they will experience the same difficulties as you will, as the people in this will experience in getting onto uh, Dillon's Road via Spindle Drive. Unless Spindle Drive is widened and the bridge is widened, there will be a great deal of trouble. Anyway, move on. The intrusion into the countryside and loss of wildlife and so on will alter the character of the neighbourhood. It was claimed at the inquiry that there would be a gap of about 20, 25 metres between the houses at the top of the site and the boundary of the development. Now, this does not appear to have been realised, and that will make an increased and significant loss of wildlife habitat. A lot has been said about the north-south retained uh, spine hedgerow, but that won't help because that will lead to nowhere. Uh, the <coughs> ground across the top of the site would have allowed the free movement of animals. This will not. Of course, we all know that the local primary schools are full, the school proposed on the avenue site will soon be full when that large estate is completed. Almost all these children will have to be taken to school by car somewhere with consequent environmental impact and pollution. Dr. Surgeries are always already very busy. Uh, those of us who suffered from the building works when the first phase was made will know that I suppose it's inevitable that it was extremely noisy, but this is a very much bigger production. And uh, in the summer, it will be necessary to wear ear protection when you're in a garden anywhere near. Just seconds remaining. Uh, we were assured that Yorkshire water would solve the problem of sewage disposal, which had been causing a lot of trouble even before this development. Can they please inform us what actual steps have been taken to deal with this issue with the addition now of 30 odd houses from uh, in, in Hockley Gardens and there's 180. This is something that I haven't heard anything about except that they've done some surveys. We've already got That's enough. three minutes, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carter. Are there any questions for Mr. Carter? No? Thank you very much. Thank you. We can move on to the agent, Paul Hill. Mr. Hill. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my name's Paul Hill from RPS, and I'm speaking on behalf of Ripon Homes. Um, members will have read the very clear officer report, and just for clarity, uh, the reserve matters application follows very, very closely the details approved at the outline stage. It has to do so as condition three of the outline consent requires this submission to accord with the illustrative layout approved at that stage. So issues such as the detail of the new access on the spindle drive have already been approved along with the overall scale and density of development on the site. 
and further matters, detailed matters already addressed within the officer report, uh, paragraph 2.2. Um, Chair, I've addressed this committee on many occasions, on many sites over many years, and I can genuinely state that on all those sites I've worked on, more attention has been paid to the detail of this application jointly with your officers and consultees than any other site I've worked on, and rightly so, particularly given the location and sensitivities of the site. Uh, it is to be observed, though, that there are no objections from the technical consultees, including uh, the District Council Street Scene and Parks teams, the County's Urban Design and Landscape Architect and the Highway Officers. The amended scheme, as advised by officers, has introduced many improvements reinforcing the block structure already approved by the illustrative layout at the outline stage, being an outward facing scheme retaining an attractive setback and frontage to Hockley Lane, along with the direct pedestrian access to it, it also provides links between the open spaces, a central spine along the line of the existing hedgerow and a defined entrance into this development with feature buildings and locations agreed through the outline stage. Very considerable collective efforts has paid off and this has resulted in a scheme acknowledged by our officers as representing good urban design with a variety and distinctive features throughout it. So Chair, in summary, there is no basis for seeking to resist this application. The decision on the outline consent acknowledged the site is not prominent in the landscape and would not be prominent or out of character. The development is well related to the settlement edge, resulting in a well thought out and attractive scheme. The provision of 40% affordable housing represents a level of provision um, which in recent times um, is um, fairly unique, I would say, Chair. And Rippen Homes, remain. Rippen Homes has fully delivered on that level of provision within phase one. Overall, Chair, I trust the very clear recommendations of your officers will therefore be endorsed and the proposals approved. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Are there any questions for Mr Hill? Councillor Armitage? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, it's been brought to uh, our uh, notice about the wildlife corridors because we don't seem to have any. And also, uh, when this went to appeal, there were, or when it came to committee last time to be for approval, there were photographs which uh, people put in, not just flooded areas, but there was uh, a great deal of sewage coming up. I mean, can we have your assurance that these problems have been overcome. Thank you Chair, through, through yourself. Um, in relation to e ecology matters, uh, yes there is a full landscape ecological mitigation and management plan that accompanies this submission. Um, so it does provide a lot of details and a very detailed land, landscaping plan that we've worked hard on with the officers that included many, many revisions to it and includes an additional 156 trees on the site, um, many of which are native trees, in particular in those public open space areas. Um, in relation to the, the, the sewage issue, Chair, th this matter was um, addressed at the outline stage, and I won't go through the inspector's report, but there was a huge amount of detail that was looked at and proofs of evidence by, by experts on this, on this very matter. Um, but just for clarity, um, there is a public sewer um, which runs in effect along the southern edge, southern side of the site, and that then goes sort of travels northwards in the adjoining field. And this development would connect up to that sewer, uh, and appropriate um, investigations of that sewer have been undertaken and modelling undertaken. That's been confirmed by Yorkshire Water. That, that means of uh, mitigation and outfall is appropriate and indeed the wastewater treatment plant is also suitable and acceptable to take the discharge from the site. Um, so hopefully, Chair, that's, uh, that answers those queries. Yes, but uh, you know, if it couldn't handle what, the, what was already there, let alone all these houses and uh, wildlife corridors, I can't see any really on these plans. And, uh, you know, it's a development in the open countryside, and I think uh, that we should have had a few more uh, wildlife corridors allowed. And also, 
uh, heating, heat pumps, solar energy, you know, green things, and uh, electric charging points. And there's nothing mentioned yet on this plan. Chair, I've probably said enough about the, the, the ecology side of things. It is detailed, very detailed in the landscape and ecological management plan. Uh, there's also an accompanying sustainability report that does look at and address the sustainability credentials that will be delivered through the site. It talks about air, so air source heat pumps. It talks about electric vehicle charging points. Those are very detailed matters, but it does go into those and it will fully meet the requirements of the building regulations, um, which is the next stage in affecting the approval process. Thank you, Chair. Any further questions? Councillor Shipman? Yeah, thank you, Chair. I just wanted to clarify, if you look at the plans with the zero, uh, obviously the, the spine of trees down the middle, I, I, I just can't fathom why the footpath to the right of that, I don't understand why it's on that side of the road, uh, making, it, I mean, if you're if you have a disability and you're in one of those houses, you don't actually have a footpath to your door. You actually have to walk, you know, if you've got a wheelchair or something, you'd have to actually go down the road, go up your own drive. And I just wondered why the footpath is not the other side of the road, like any normal development that we've seen in front of us. Uh, I just wondered if you had an explanation for that. Yeah, there's a footpath, just to be clear, uh, Chair, there's, there's a we've, we've retained the, the length of that central hedgerow. The only two areas which, in effect, have been punched through is to take the the spine row that goes through the centre of the site that follow the illustrative layout, at the outline stage, and indeed the footpath follows the illustrative layout that was approved at the outline stage. Um, there's a footpath on that right, a public footpath on that right hand side that connects all the way from, in effect, the north to the south on the right hand side of the hedge and connects to the leap at the bottom, the bottom of the southern part of the site. Um, so it's been designed by that for that purpose really to provide appropriate setbacks and appropriate connectivity to the to the open space on either side. Any further questions, comments? Thank you, Mr. Hill. Um, we'll move on. Are there any comments or questions to the planning officer? Um, I'll open the floor for discussion and debate. Councillor Armitage is indicating, Chair. Jane Barry's speaking at the moment. And then I we'll do apologise. Um, well, as the, there was no comments at the point that I started to speak, so I was just going to move officers' recommendations. Councillor Armitage? Uh, it was just the point that uh, when I saw, uh, uh, when we first uh, looked at this site, it was a terrible mess as regards the sewage and it's all right getting it couldn't handle the sewage as it had already got and i think like the foot the site that we've mentioned before we have all these uh, things uh put in place or so called put in place uh and yorkshire water have said oh yes we can handle this but they couldn't handle the amount of sewage that was going down uh, previously to this. I mean, it was an absolute disgrace what was happening. The site is a wet site, you know, like the last one. But in spite of all this, in spite of all the toilet paper and feces running all over the site, the uh, inspector went with it. And, uh, you know, I couldn't understand why, but there you are. Councillor Armitage, I can update you on the Yorkshire, York, uh, Yorkshire water. They are actually doing work down there and they've done quite comprehensive um, surveys and they are in the process of um, purchasing some land to put in extra pumping stations, etc. So I don't have a real concern anymore about this. Um, right. I'm going to bring uh, Adrian Kirkham in at the moment. I'm just going to, uh, on that point, Chair, just 
um, reiterate what Mr. Hill has said to, to members chair. The, the issue, these issues were raised with the inspector when considering the appeal a couple of years ago and were resolved certainly to the inspector's satisfaction then. But he did impose various conditions that aren't before you this afternoon, but which will need to be addressed at the appropriate time. And Mr. Hill is aware of that on behalf of his clients that will then require these details to be agreed with the council at that point, Chair. We will, of course, consult with the, the various bodies, Yorkshire Water, Seven Trent, et cetera, et cetera, to ensure that the appropriate um, foul and in-service water sewerage system are put in place. And that's one of the reasons why at this point, the attenuation basin is still an outstanding matter because that will need to be designed both to achieve the ecological enhancements that we're looking at and which members have talked about and which again the applicants and uh, Mr Hale have said they're willing to work with the council to achieve but also to ensure there's an appropriate engineering solution so both in terms of ecology and surface water engineering there are still matters that we're working on but we do have an understanding with Mr Hale on behalf of his clients that we will work towards those solutions and I re reiterate with the, the comments that Mr Hill have made, we, we come across many developers, but in this instance, I think the commitment, the ongoing commitment by the applicants to deliver on their promise to provide 40% affordable housing is actually um, one way that the developer in this instance is showing, yes, that they do wish to work with the council and they will, wherever possible, keep the commitments they've made in front of the, the inspector back in 2018 and with your officers subsequently, Chair. Hopefully that provides a help and clarity and reassurance to members on those points. Yes, uh, th thank you, Adrian. Uh, well, uh, without being uh, accused of uh, jumping in too early, uh, I'll second that uh, motion that uh, Council Barry has put forward. Thank you. Well, then, sorry, Chair, the motion you have then before you is to move officer recommendations. Indeed. Are you ready to move to the vote? Yes, please. Okay, uh, members, we will be um, voting um, um, for, against, or abstain to go with the off, off, sorry, officer recommendations, uh, which is to grant permission. Uh, could you clearly say for, against, or abstain? Councillor Armitage. For. Councillor Barry. Councillor Barry, I'm not sure your microphone is working. For. Councillor Cooper. For. Councillor Elliott. For. Councillor Foster. For. Councillor Huckabee. Four. Councillor Potts. Four. Councillor Powell. Four. Councillor Reader. Four. Councillor Rouse. Four. Councillor Ruff. Four. And Councillor Shipman. Four. Chair, that is 12 votes for, zero against, zero abstentions. Officer recommendations are carried. Thank you all very much. Move on to application number three. This is NED forward slash two zero forward slash seven zero zero seven nine five forward slash FL. Application to vary conditions and planning application eighteen forward slash zero zero one seven seven forward slash FL. <clears throat> Hand over to the planning officer to give his presentation. Thank you, Chair. If I refer members to the late comments, I will do comments from both an objective and the Last slides, please. Emily, we can't hear you very well. Yeah, sorry. Is that better? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I refer members to the late comments where we've received comments from both an objector and the agent. Spread the slides, please.
Thank you, Nikki. This is a retrospective application to vary condition two, the approved plans of planning application 18 forward slash 00177 forward slash FL to allow for the increased footprint, alter height of roof, verge detailing, amended doorway positions, proposed fenestration, and changes to the internal layout. Next slide, please. The application site is highlighted in orange and is located approximately 300 metres to the south of the B5075 and Darwin Forest Country Park as a point of reference. And is sited 110 metres to the north of the neighbouring dwelling, Charlestown. The site is, out, is located outside of any defined settlement development limit. This slide shows the location plan. The site features a central location, which is open in character and bound by fields. To the east is an area of woodland, which is managed by the Woodland Commission, whilst to the south there are two dwellings, the applicant's dwelling and the neighbouring dwelling. Next slide, please. Thank you. This slide shows the block plan of the building subject to the application, detailing the proposed hard landscaping which will surround the building. This will comprise of a one metre wide footpath, a disabled access ramp and an area of grass creek to allow for a safe access to the building. Thank you. The next slide illustrates the floor plan. The building will be used as an observation shelter and dinghy store, store, water filtration and a disabled toilet. The elevations plan illustrate the one metre increase in height, which has created a steeper roof pitch, verge and fenestration details. Thank you. This slide shows the approved amendment elevation plans. This shows a lower building with a more simplistic verge and fenestration details. Thank you. This slide shows the proposed landscaping plan, including further enhancement landscaping through the planting of additional trees and shrubs around the site, which over time will provide screening for the site. Thank you. The first photo is taken from the east of the site, showing the side elevation of the building. To the left and background of the photo is the neighbouring property Flash Farm, which features a similar roof design and detailing. The next slide, please, Nikki. Thank you. This is a third photo taken from the east, showing the front elevation of the building, including the wildlife hatch opening. Thank you. This photo is taken from the west of the site, showing the fenestration details. It is noted that the area around the building would be made good and reverted back to grass. Thank you. This is a further photo taken from the west of the site, adjacent to the pond. The photo shows a large amount of planting that has already been undertaken, which over time will mature and soften the site. Thank you. This photo is taken from the side of the building, looking back towards the applicant dwelling and the neighbouring property, which are sited approximately 110 metres away. Thank you. This is a further photo showing the existing landscaping, which has been planted around the site from the building to the centre. Thank you. This is a further photo taken from the field to the north, looking back towards the building, the pond, and the neighbouring properties to the rear. Thank you. Uh, and lastly, this photo is taken close to the woodland area to the east of the site, showing the entirety of the site. Um, and that's the end of the presentation. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Are there any points of clarification at this point? Councillor Potts, Councillor Armitage, and bear in mind these are just clarification. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, my question, Emily, relates to the, the neighbours. Um, your report said that there is one neighbour 110 metres to the north. Um, I'm sure it, one of the complainants stated that they lived 40 metres from this building. Could you just clarify that, please? Yes, um, just, just for clarity, it may be my mistake, but the neighbour neighbouring property is to the south of, of the building. So maybe um um but in terms of the distances, um I believe the 40 metres is to the boundary, but the 110 metres is to the building. Councillor Armitage. Yeah, uh could you it's outside the settlement development limit and in in the special landscape area, this isn't it? Um, that's correct. It is outside the settlement development limit. However, it's not within a special landscape area. So that was mentioned in the late vet comment. 
Okay. Thank you. We'll move on to the first speaker, which is Mr. Keith Moore. Mr. Moore. Hello there, can you hear me? I can hear you, we can't see you. You can't see me, oh, hang on. Are we on? We are. Yeah. You have three minutes, Mr. Moore. Sorry? Three minutes from when you're ready. Yes, okay. Uh, I am Keith Moore. Uh, our house is Charlestown, directly overlooked to look my neighbour's development, which is situated within, a, like we would informed it was a special landscape area. The principle of development here was established by the granting of the 2017 wildlife scheme, which consisted of two small wildlife ponds surrounded by a wildflower meadow. It is not as stated by Emily in the report in paragraph 8.1. My neighbor had breached his consent when he instead constructed a three times larger than consented deep water fishing lake. There is no wildflower meadow, the field grass is, is mown short and the pond is heavily stocked with fish. And because of these factors, the site is no longer considered to be of much wildlife value or, or value to an environmental scheme. This is also the current view of the Derbyshire Wildlife Trust psychologist, which I've spoken to on the phone. When these factors include the true intrusive car parking around the lake, fishing matches and other at other times, and a domestic style building and its likely domestic use is considered as a whole, it is evident that harm to the special landscape area and public community now outweighs any ecological and environmental benefits which this scheme had promised to provide. Our residential privacy and the amenity here at Charlestown are harmed by the activities around this building and lake. <clears throat> The 2018 planning application was for boat store and a bird hide. The current building has all services connected and it is not of a design which is required for the state of purposes. The unauthorised domestic features including glazed trench doors and windows, the unauthorised increase in the builds, building's height and footprint, the unauthorised vast increase in the size of the pond for use of the fishing lake, the unauthorised dumping of hundreds of tonnes of excavated clay waste material, tree root stumps and other rubbish next to our boundary, illustrate the disregard the applicant has for us and for the planning system. The late addition to this application to provide for disabled car parking. Can you hear me? Yes. No, can you hear me? Yes. Did you hear what I've been saying? Yes. Yes. It's telling me it stopped. Um, can I continue from where I left off? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll give you a few more seconds. Yes, carry on. Yeah, uh, did you get the 2018 planning application push for boat store? Did you get that far? Yes. Okay, I'll, I'll continue from then for me. Uh, the unauthorised domestic features, including glazed French doors and windows, the unauthorised increase in the building's height and footprint, the unauthorised vast increase in the size of the pond for, for use as a fishing lake, the unauthorised dumping of hundreds of tonnes of excavated clay waste material, tree root stumps and other rubbish next to our boundary illustrate the disregard the applicant has for us and the planning system. 30 seconds remain. The late addition to this application to provide for disabled car parking in what will eventually become a patio area around the building will surely lead to further planning use breaches. The original controversial, controversial siting and now the unauthorised domestic design features of this new building do not comply with planning policies SS1, SS9, PPS21, CT1, CT13, GS1, GS5. That's three yes. minutes, Chair. Yeah, I'm just going to allow him a couple of extra uh, seconds. Yeah, you didn't hear me. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Um, I'm just a message from uh, Adrian Kirkham. He was, wishes to say something, Adrian. Just, just very briefly, Chair, just to clarify the point about the special landscape area you've uh, you've mentioned. In um, in my report, I do set out at paragraph 2.6, it's within the designated special landscape area. My apologies, Chair, that's my mistake. The site does not lie within the special landscape area, but it is within an area of countryside. So I apologise for 
um, that area chair. Thank you. Are there any questions for Mr Moore? No? Thank you, Mr Moore. Thank you, Chair. Okay, are there any questions now for the planning officer? Councillor Armitage? Uh, could you uh, just confirm, uh, as it's uh, no longer in uh, special landscape area, uh, it, but it is development in the countryside uh, as such, isn't it? Uh, as in, uh, and it's outside, you know, it's contrary to SS9. Would I be right in this? Chair, yeah, just, just on that, um, the site has, has never formed part of the, the special landscape area. As I say, Chair, my, my apologies for my yeah. mistake on that. Um, the 2005 local plan um, clearly sets out where the, the SLA is. And as, as you know, in your publication draft local plan, the uh, special landscape areas are not being introduced into that. But um, my apologies again, Chair. The site does lie within the countryside, yes, as, as Kazra Armitage says. You will need to consider whether you believe this development is sympathetic to and acceptable within the countryside. countryside. Your policies don't preclude development within such areas, but you need to make sure that their character appearance is, is appropriate and you need to balance that. And as officers, we don't believe the proposal is contrary to that policy. And in that, we take into account what is already permitted, as Emily outlined to you in the presentation. So there is a building approved on the site. And we've also taken into account, Chair, the nature of uh, the building, where it's located, the level of landscaping that will, over time, grow up and ameliorate any impact. So we've taken all those things into consideration, Chair, in our recommendation to uh, yourselves as the planning committee. So as officers, we don't believe it would be contrary to your policies, but of course, you as the decision maker need to take that view and, and come to a, a balanced judgment on it. But the footprint's far bigger than uh, originally uh proposed isn't it again chair as emily's outlined to, to you that the, the building is slightly larger and slightly taller than has been approved yes but uh, that doesn't necessarily chair make it unacceptable you need to have that make that judgment as to whether you believe it's in accordance with your policies and acceptable in this countryside location i've set out the issues that we've taken into account as officers in our assessment of the matter chair thank you, thank you. Councillor Barry. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think for me, looking at this, this is nothing like the plans that were originally passed, um, regardless of, of uh, whether it's well built or not. Um, the, the original design was far smaller with the roof height being nowhere near what it is now. It didn't have a, a window at the top half of the, uh, the roof um, and it wouldn't have had French patio doors. It had wooden doors for a boat to be brought in and out of the, the building. I'm a bit concerned, Adrian, that we we seem to be um, sort of saying it's all right for you to go off track and, and not follow the plans that you've had passed and that we're, we're not going to object to it because, all right, it's not too far away from what it was going to be. Well, from what I can see of it, the building is nothing like the original building that was proposed. You haven't got the wild meadow in there that was proposed. You've got a, a massive fishing lake instead of two small ponds. So to me, this goes right against the application that was passed. Um, and I don't see how we can possibly accept what has happened to this property. It's, you know, I mean, I know we can't project what might happen in the future, but the way this has been built and altered is certainly opening up for other applications in the future. It doesn't represent what we passed. Um, and I think we've got to go back to what we passed. And I'm sorry, I don't agree with this application. I don't agree with um, some of the comments that have been made in the report about that, um, you know, the height and everything is still within uh, a reasonable um, size. It's not, it's not what was passed and we shouldn't be able to carry on letting things like this happen. Thank you. Okay, Jeff, I may just briefly come back uh, to, uh, to you on the points that Councillor Barry's made. Um, as officers, we, we accept absolutely that it's not as approved and as set out in the presentation that Emily gave to you, we've set out there the, the plans that 
do have permission and can be constructed and we accept that this isn't in accordance with those hence the need for the application that's the, the path that we've taken the fact that the building isn't in accordance with what's previously been approved shouldn't be the determining factor you need to consider whether the building as constructed or almost completed whether that is acceptable in, when set against your policies and all the other matters that you may wish to take into account and that's the judgment you need to make not just that it isn't in accordance with what was previously approved are there any councillor foster uh, are we still on uh, have we opened it up to debate now or are we still on asking questions to officers i'm sorry if i missed that i understood the chair you're still asking questions of officers at this point thank you Are there any further questions? No? Councillor Armitage, Councillor Shipman? Yeah, uh, the, uh, I noticed that, yes, it is retrospective. And uh, the other thing is the size of ponds, uh, which were originally uh, uh, suggested or we, which we gave planning permission for, as, uh, you know, is greatly it's about three times the size and the fact that they're heavily stocked as well looks to me very much uh, i don't know whether you think or members think but looks as though it's going to be a commercial setup for uh one day fishing permits and things like that and judging by the number of cars that have been seen there uh that's what i think and the actual building well you could live in it couldn't you it's all connected up Okay, Councillor Shipman. Um, if I could just come in there, please. Um, yes, certainly. Carry on, Emily. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, just, just to Councillor Armitage, um, the, the ponds do not form part of this application. We're only assessing you know, the amendments to the building. We're not considering the ponds of this application. And initially, they were two separate applications. Yeah, I'm just looking at the reasoning behind it. Thank you. Councillor Shipman. Thank you, Chair. Um, can I just make, make this clear? Is this a retrospective planning application? Or have, are, are we asking for amendments to the original one and they've just gone off to kill to well, what's happened with it? Because I don't quite understand what's going on here because I wasn't here for the passing of the first one. It sounds... Have they just done whatever they wanted to and then now they're coming back for us to correct that? Is it, is it possible, Chair, through you just to ask Nick if she can bring back the, uh, the presentation? I'll hopefully that will help explain to, to members what's happened here and Emily will be able to um, come in if I get anything wrong. But if you able yeah, just to bring the presentation back up, Nicola. Nick, I do. Nicky. Apologies. I've set it up for the next application. If you just give me a moment, or do, do you know which where, where you'd like to see? It's just the plans. The uh, we've got um, the, the plans of what was what has been approved is it's it's about five or six slides in to uh, the, the application. Okay, I'm just sharing my screen now. Just a, a couple further on, please. Sorry about this. Uh, just just while uh, Nikki's doing that, uh, Chair. Yes, uh, as Councillor Shipman says, the we have approved an application for a building on the site, so that has consent. The applicants have then, for whatever reason, built something not in accordance with those drawings. And they're now seeking consent in retrospect to retain it. So it, it just of those on the left hand side, uh, Nikki, it's uh, two, no, one up from where you are now. So just that one there, please. So that's the building that has consent. So that's been cons consented. And as you can see, it's got the, the double doors in one side and the wildlife hatch to the north elevation and the small window on that west elevation and the windows to the rear to the toilet and the store and water filtration element of there. And then if you can just go up, um, I think that, yes, that's what is now the subject of this application. So 
as Emily outlined, it is slightly larger in terms of its footprint and taller, but it, in our view as officers, it retains the features that were originally in the other building, i.e. the two side doors, the, the wildlife hatch and the storm water filtration area, disabled toilet, etc. And you need to consider whether that building is acceptable or not. The other issues, again, as Emily's mentioned, are other matters that are under investigation in terms of the altered pond configuration and size, and we're following that under up under its own um, investigation. But this is the building that's before you. So in short, um, Councillor Shipman, yes, it's a retros retrospective application seeking to retain what's built, bearing in mind that on the screen now is the fallback position as approved. Thanks, Nikki. Thank you. Are there any further questions? Councillor Reader? Yeah, it's a comment. Um, Councillor um, Roth, am I allowed to comment now or has it got to be a question? Realistically, it should be the next bit. Okay, I'll wait for the next part then. Any further questions? Thank you. I'll open the floor now for discussion and debate. And I think Councillor Foster was first, then Councillor Reader, then Councillor Shipman. Uh, yeah, thanks for that, Chair. Uh, my concern for this is it doesn't seem to be following what was it was originally uh, given permission for. And much like comments that have been made already, to me, it looks like this could almost be a domestic property. And it could be a domestic property in future. That's what it looks like to me. Uh, from what Councillor Barry said, uh, earlier, I definitely support her comments. Uh, condition two was there for a reason. Uh, this 1.3 meter taller uh, to me is out of character with the area and in excess of size uh, required for its use. Uh, so my own comments are this. Um, this is contrary to policy BE1 of the adopted local plan, which requires the new development should respect the character and appearance of the surrounding area. So BE1 of the adopted local plan and policy GS5, which requires that development should not be detrimental to the character and appearance of the site and should not have a detrimental effect on the amenities of neighboring occupiers and users. So policy B, one of the adopted local plan and policy GS5. Uh, if officers want to comment on that or other any other councils want to comment on that, but they're my comments in that it, um, uh, that, it, uh, that it goes against those two policies. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Reader. Yeah, I find myself uh, agreeing with Councillor Foster. Um, he's literally taken the words out of my mouth, so I won't labour it. Um, just exactly the same feeling, really. Thank you, Councillor Shipman. Yes, yeah, similar, really. I, I mean, this comes down to the fact is, would we approve it if it came to us now and there was no previous one? That's what it boils down to for me. And my feeling is, no, we wouldn't with, with, with double glazing doors and, and it, you know, it basically being a, a, a small bungalow, if you like. Um, and, and I don't think we would approve it because it is in the countryside. And to me, it's got to blend in with the countryside and therefore pictures and fittings need to be worn. And, you know, if, if it's what they say it's going to be, which is a dinghy store, then it should have wooden doors in it and it should be almost a shed. If that's what it, that's what it is, isn't it? They want it for a viewing shed, basically. And I think that it, it, it shouldn't need that level of, you know, intricacy. If it's just a, if it is just a viewing shed, um, and I think that on the basis of where they're at with it, I don't think we we would approve this application if it had come to us fresh today anyway. Um, so I, I'm hearing on the side of rejecting this application and it, it returning back to the original one that was approved. And is that a motion, Councillor Shipman? If everyone's done speaking, uh, Chair, then yes. I'll second Councillor Foster's, which I think he was trying to do. May, may I just come in, Chair, just to grab that clarity that Councillor Foster was asking for, please, at, at the appropriate time, Chair. Yeah, if you'd like to do that now, that's fine, Adrian. Um, I don't think as, as officers we've anything to, to add, Chair. Councillor Shipman's correct. You need to consider this on the basis of would you give permission for what's before you? That's right, bearing in mind the, the fallback position, all the other matters. So that, that's exactly the consideration you need to, to undergo. Just in terms of Councillor Foster's points, Chair, I've noted that um, the motion is set out as the building 
is in, would be in the opinion of the planning committee out of character with the area due to its, I, I think um, Councillor Foster mentions uh, the increased size and height. And then um, Councillor Foster mentioned a couple of policies, Chair. I think with respect, he was probably meant to say policy GS6 rather than policy GS5. Um, and note that, Chair, and um, policy BE1. But I'd also um, ask members, Chair, if you're minded to refuse the application on that in any reason for refusal, we'd also recommend that you add in the policies in the publication draft local plan, the corresponding policies in terms of countryside protection and um, protection of new development in terms of the character and appearance of the area. So there's equivalent policies to GS6 and B1 in the publication draft local plan, Chair. Okay, thank you. If there's no other, co Councillor Foster? Yeah, I'd, uh, I'd happily put that uh, in the motion, GS6, uh, BE1, um, and to refuse. Okay, can we have clarification then on the motion for the clerk? Okay, so the way I've caught that then, it's to refuse the application for the reasons just specified in terms of its uh, failure to meet um, the requirements of planning policy, in particular GS6 and the others which were mentioned. Is that the essence of it, members? AP13 as well, Alan. The AP13? Landscape, landscape character. In, in the emerging local plan, that is. Just, just on that point, uh, Chair, I um, forgot to mention the, the Ashover neighbourhood plan that uh, I think Councillor Shipman is referring to in terms of the, the relevant yeah. policies protecting the countryside and, and character of the area. My, my apologies, Chair, that, that would be appropriate to add those in if members are minded to refuse the application. But I, I would ask, Chair, if, if members are, are minded to refuse the application, that the final wording is um, agreed with yourself before final issuing. That's okay. Yourself and, and Councillor Barry will be normally we'd, we'd agree it with. That's fine. Thank you. So to refuse the application for the uh, grounds that we've uh, now just discussed, uh, with the final conditions or the final sort of uh, um, sort of uh, wording of this uh, agreed uh, by the planning manager with um, yourself and with the vice chair. That I'm, happy with, I'm happy to propose that. Yeah. I'll second that, Chair. So it's moved by Councillor Foster and seconded by Councillor Shipman. Okay. Nikki, are you ready for a roll call? Yes, of course, Chair. So the motion is to refuse the application. Uh, please can you clearly say for, against or abstain. Councillor Armitage. For. Councillor Barry. For. Councillor Cooper. For. Councillor Elliott. Councillor Elliott. Sorry, for. Councillor Foster. Or. Councillor Huckabee. For. Councillor Potts. Or. Councillor Powell. Or. Councillor Reader. Or. Councillor Rouse. Or. Councillor Ruff. Or. And Councillor Shipman. Four. That's 12 votes, four, zero against, zero abstentions, um, and the motion to refuse has been carried. Thank you, everybody. And we can move on to the final application, which is NED forward slash two zero forward slash zero zero nine two one forward slash SLH application of um, to allow garage repositioning amended plans at Cobalee. I'm going to ask the planning officer to give their demonstration. Chair, just before um, Alice comes in, if I can just make one point about um, a number of the photographs we've been asked to, to put in the presentation to you. They'll come at the end of this presentation, Chair, and they're photographs that have been asked to be, be shown by um, various parties and we've acceded to that as they've been primarily included in the late reps report but they're seeking to exemplify points made by third parties that will speak to you chair and they are they are annotated appropriately but we just need to be clear that Alice will go through those with you chair they are not officer photos chair and we can't take any responsibility for the 
accuracy of what they're seeking to depict. But I'm sure the various speakers will take you through that in due course. Thank you. Over to you, Alice. Thank you. Thanks, Nikki. Thank you, Chair. This application is to allow for the repositioning of a garage approved under planning application 19 forward slash 00255 FLH at Clover Lee, Chapel Hill, Ashover. I refer members to the late comments um, that we have received um, from uh, some of the objectors and they're in the uh, late comments pack. Um, so just go, carrying on, um, Cloverley is located on a corner plot with Chapel Hill on two sides. So, um, and you can see it highlighted in orange on this plan. To the southwest of the site is a private access road, which also serves the properties to the northwest. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? The garden of Cloverley slopes steeply away from the house. This proposal is for a detached garage situated in front of and below the main house. The roof of the garage will serve as a garden accessed from the double doors to the front of the property. The land slopes away from Cloverley and away from Lee's Owls, the house next door. As a result, the garage will be built into the hill in the northwest corner. In the northwest corner. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, due to the problems with levels, the applicant has found it necessary to move the location of the garage two metres further forward than that approved under the 2019 application. It will also be set down by 40 centimetres from the level of the patio. The garage will be slightly closer to the boundary with Lee's Owls to the west by approximately 70 centimetres. However, it's still 3.5 metres away. A parapet wall of one metre in height will enclose the garden. You can see the plans here. Um, the cutout area of this parapet wall shown on the front elevation drawing there um, shows that a fence will be installed two meters behind the parapet wall. Um, this has been put forward by the applicant as a way of preventing general access to the last two meters of the roof garden, which will render the usable garden space the same as that approved in 2019. We could go on to the next slide, please. Um, application 19002255 FLH, which was approved in 2019, included alterations to the main house as well as the construction of the garage, and that these are the plans for that. The proposed garage is to be built of natural stone to match the existing house and the Ashover vernacular. Can we go to the next slide, please? As you, uh, so these are the plans that were approved in 2019. And as you can see, the garage design was the same as that proposed in the application you have before, before you today. The main difference is the new proposal is two meters further forward from the house than that of the 2019 application. The new proposal is also to be set down by, an, uh, by 40 centimeters. It is also approximately 70 centimeters closer to the boundary wall with the house to the west. Um, if we can go to next slide. I hope these photos will give you an idea of the site. So this is a view of Clover Lee from, Chapel, from the bottom of Chapel Hill. So you can see the house in the middle there. You can see the base of the patio just in front of the French windows. Um, the garage will be built forward of this. To the right is Derwent Cottage and to the left of Clover Lee is Lee Sowles. None of the houses to the east of Chapel Hill have windows directly overlooking the development site. Uh, next slide, please. This is a view of the proposal from the private road to the east of Chapel Hill. You can see the base of the patio. So that's that um, bit with the holes in it. Um, and this, uh, this will have a one meter high wall on top of it. The roof of the garage will be positioned 40 centimetres below this base and will come forward by seven metres. Again, there'll be the parapet wall on top of it. Um, if you can go to the next slide and then the one after, because we've got them in, that's another view from the same, that's it. Um, this is another view from further up Chapel Hill in front of Touchstone. Um, as you can see, um, so you can see that there's some hedging there. Um, and the, the roof of the garage will be sort of in that gap that you can see there. Um, next slide, please. 
Uh, oh, sorry, I've just lost my place. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, this is the view from in front of Hawthorne Cottage, so a bit further up uh, Chapel Hill. Um, note that there is substantial hedging and there is potential to condition the improvement and retention of this hedge. If we go to the next slide, please. Uh, this is going back down to the bottom of the site. So this is the view along the private road, which forms the access to Clover Lee and then goes further on to the other properties further on. The fence to the right is the Garden of Clover Lee and the fence to the left is the boundary with Overcroft, which is below. Uh, and then the next slide, please. Thank you. The patio has been constructed and the footings and concrete plan for the garage have been installed. The wall in the foreground of this photograph is the rear of the garage, and this is 6.5 metres forward of the house. The garage will come forward of this by seven metres to the timber shuttering that you can see in the foreground there. A parapet wall will encircle the garden on the top. Note the vegetation on the left between the patio garden and Lee's Owls. It is considered that this helps to reduce the impact of views from the garden back towards the windows in the side of Lee's Owls. Um, next slide, please. This photo shows the relationship between the proposed garage and the boundary with Lee's Owls. There's a 3.5 metre gap between the side elevation of the garage and the boundary wall. Uh, next slide, please. Um, oh, this photo. Oh, sorry. Did we just skip one or have I gone wrong? <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Never mind. Uh, no, go on. Go to the next one. That's okay. Sorry. Um, so this is a view um, into the into the garden of Lee's house from the um, from the gap uh, between the two where the drive's going to be. If we can go to the next one, please. Oh yeah, thank you. Um, so this is the view from um, the uh, top of the patio into the garden of Lee's Owls. As you can see, these views are of the bottom of the front garden and the drive, not of the area of the garden most closely associated with the house. Actually, sorry, could you go back to the previous slide? I've just forgot to make a comment. Yeah, um, you see the little hedge in the middle there. Behind there, the, uh, the person who has that house is, does have um, it seems to have like a table and some chairs, so they probably do sit out there. Um, if you can then move on to the slide after next, sorry, <laughs> to jump backwards and forwards. There we go. Um, this is a view from uh, the garden to the front of Lee's house, looking back up towards um, Clover Lee. Oh, sorry. And the last slide, please. And this is another view. Take Taken from close to where they have the table and chairs. Um, the garage that's approved under permission 19225 FLH will approximately be in line with the, um, the rose bush, and there's, there's two taller trees and the rose bush in the middle, so it'll be approximately in line with that. Um, whereas the garage um, proposed under this application is approximately in line with the small tree on the right, um, in the right hand side. Um, the, the following um, photographs are the ones that have been submitted. I, I can either just go to show, we can just go through them or I uh, think we can, are we able to use, show them when the speakers are speaking, Nikki? Um, yes, I can do that. Um, I don't know if, if that's going to be easier. I think it probably will be. Okay, thanks, Alice. Are there any points of clarification? Not questions or comments, just clarification. Councillor Armitage and then Councillor Potts. Yeah, uh, on the plan that you've got on page 97, it shows that the actual red line uh, encloses the uh, private road that goes up. So it, it's totally inaccurate because it, it looks as if it's much bigger, uh, the actual uh, site, than is actually shown. Uh, and you can see that if you look at uh, the photographs which you've provided, which show vans being parked on that actual, uh, on that piece. And you've also said about there are no windows overlooking uh, some 
well there is from the counting house there are there is a window from a lounge overlooking uh, the site of clover leaf and would i be right in saying that this is a retrospective planning application as we can see uh, i mean why uh, uh, why can't people just stick to the plans which are passed? And, you know, I mean, are they incapable of uh, following simple measurements? So if you could just um, rectify that, please. Um, so the red line um, has to include any lands that's required for carrying out the application, so uh, for the development. So in this case, the, the access. So that's why the red line, the access is within the red line because you have to be able to access the uh, garden from the highway. Um, but but it's, it's not in the applicant's uh, ownership, is it? It doesn't have, uh, well, uh, if it isn't, uh, we, I, don't, I don't think, I think they've said that it is in their ownership. Um, well, it's public access through to the, uh, it's a but private they can still own, They can not. still own that bit of it, can't they? They haven't, um, as far as I'm aware, they haven't um, submitted, uh, they haven't signed Certificate B, so they've said that they own that land. Right. Um, so as far as, I, I, when I made my visit, I couldn't see how any houses with side uh, windows that looked onto the applicant site, but I'm, um, yeah, if, if I've missed that, then I apologise. Yes, um, and, if, and as far as the retrospective element goes, the applicant has a permission and he has built, yeah, th th there has, has been, uh, I, I mean, no doubt he's going to speak and he will explain why he hasn't been able to build it at the, in the location that it was intended. Um, so and just ask so it, it is, well, it is okay. retrospective. It, it is in the sense that it that the yeah. footings have been put in, but the actual yeah. building has not been constructed yet. Well, all those blocks are built up, aren't they, for the back that's, wall? Yeah, that's the, the front of the patio wall, isn't it? Yeah. And also the fact that uh, something like, uh, I, I believe, six loads of ready mix were put in for the base of this uh, one. So in my uh, judgment, this has been started, so it's retrospective. Chair, am I able to speak at this point? It's Michael Waitman. No, you, you, you're not allowed to speak at the moment. Uh, Adrian Kirkham? Yeah, Chair, just, just very briefly, yes, just one, one query I've got of Councillor Armitage. I think you mentioned Councillor Armitage, there was a window in at the counting house. Yes. Are you able to, to identify that on the... Um, the plan in the papers, which one that is, please. I can't see a counting house on there. Uh, it's on Chapel Hill. This part of it is opposite the entrance. Right. That, what's what's shown as cottage at page 97. Uh, yeah, there's two, there's two things. There are two buildings there. If you see, there's a dividing wall. And yeah. The counting house is the top side. Right, okay. Yeah, I know, know what you mean now. And okay. just on the issue of the, the issue of retrospective or not, as, as Alice has outlined, Chair, the, the building that the applicant seeking consent for, no, that hasn't been completed yet. He's uh, He may have put some footings down and built some block walls. But again, as Alice has outlined, he does have permission to undertake certain works there. So in this instance, I think um, my view would be this is a, an application for which he's seeking consent for rather than an application that he's seeking consent to retain in its totality. And I appreciate there may be some overlapping between the two, but he's certainly not finished construction of the building as you have before you on the plans that you've just seen. Thank you. Councillor Potts. Thank you, Chair. But Councillor Armitage, um... He read my mind. That was exactly the point I was going to make. It, this, to me, does look like a, a retrospective um, application, um, as it clearly has been started. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any further questions for the officer? No? OK. Um, with that, we'll move on to the first speaker which I believe is Councillor Chris Miller's 
Ashover Parish Council. Councillor Miller. Yes. Good afternoon. My name is Councillor Chris Miller and I live in the village of Ashover. Uh, I am thank you for letting me address you today as a member of Ashover Parish Council and I'd like to speak to you regarding the planning application 20-00921 forward slash FLH to allow for garage repositioning amended plans at Cloverley, Chapel Hill, Ashover. Ashover Parish Council does not agree with the recommendation put before you for the following reasons. We believe that the relocation changes the character and appearance of the site and has a significant detrimental effect on the amenities of the neighbours, including great loss of privacy and light caused by the proximity and bulk of the structure in the proposed new location. This also does not take into account any noise pollution created by the activities within the garage or from the terrace. This is demonstrated by a submitted photograph using a 4.5 metre high ladder sat onto the actual building footing. I would also like to bring to your attention that whilst the parapet is 4.5 metres high at the front, any person using the terrace standing would have a sight line approximately 6.5 metres above the ground level. I have submitted and thank you for showing the photographs that show the uh, picture as from Lizos. The principle of development has been accepted and is granted in application 19 forward slash 00225 forward slash FLH. However, the relocation completely changes the outlook from the neighboring properties. This is not in accordance with neighborhood plan policy AP1 sections A, B, D and H and local plan H5. Northeast Derbyshire local plan GS5 accepts development for the original grant but does not take into account the significant impact of the proposed relocation. It is also reported in clause 7.8.2 of the officer's report that users of the overlooked part of the garden at Lee's House is not that which is closely associated with the house. Whereas in reality, this is the main part of the garden for Lee's House and it will be totally overlooked. In the last 18 months, we've had numerous complaints received by Ashover Parish Council in relation to noise, environmental contamination and highways obstruction, each time requiring attendance by officers from enforcement and the police at considerable cost to the ratepayer. Our conclusion, Ashover Parish Council opposed the new location of the development as it is contrary to the Neighbourhood Development Plan, where we were looking to ensure that if any development was undertaken- 30 seconds remaining. Thank you. Then it should match in with its surroundings, should not be an eyesore and should not cause any of the neighboring properties, problems or annoyance. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you. Are there any questions? Councillor Armitage? Yeah, uh, you've, uh, Councillor Miller, you, you've mentioned about uh, uh, the, the nuisance uh, of uh, of this development already uh, could you uh, perhaps tell us a bit more a bit clearly uh, what, what these uh, nuisance problems have been thank you councillor armitage i will i will expand as best as i can and we fully understand that any development will cause uh, a nuisance factor however the nuisance factors that have been reported to ashover parish council have been quite considerable in this event including blocking of roadways, restriction of highways, um, environmental issues caused by dust and noise, even through weekends and bank holidays. Uh, this is typical of the sort of situation that we, we have heard about and been reported to us. And, and in your judgment, do, do, does the council uh, look at this as a retrospective uh, uh, development? I have to say, Councillor Armitage, that I am not a planning officer. However, uh, having visited the site on several occasions and viewed the existing works, there is evidence of the uh, considerable footings that have been cast further forward from the original location, caused by problems that I will not elaborate on because I do not know the details, but the location is completely different. Virtually the whole of the gardens of Cloverley are now taken over by the footings for the new garage. Total loss of the original amenity of the gardens of Cloverley. Thank you, Councillor. 
Thank you. Are there any further questions? No. Thank you, Councillor Miller. Thank you very much. Move on to the next speaker, which is Mike Thomas. Hi there, Chair. Can you hear me? You have three minutes, Mr. Thomas. Right, thank you. Now, I live with my partner in Touchstone, which is neighbouring property to the applicant. Now, I'll make a few general comments, then table three specific requests for the planning committee to consider. I must first of all say that the overriding theme in all eight letters of objection relate to concerns about privacy. And it's with this in mind, I'm very surprised that uh, in most of the pictures taken from neighbouring properties, the planning officer uh, didn't extrapolate the roof line by drawing it in on the pictures. I know that uh, latterly we've seen some from uh, other objectors. Also, um, I'm puzzled as to why the planning officer didn't stand on the patio itself and take pictures looking east. I noticed there was one from west. That would have given a much better perspective uh, as far as my interest in Touchstone are concerned. Now, I can certainly say this with some confidence because a few weeks ago, the applicant's contractors were having a tea break from the patio, gazing down at my partner who was in our garden. These omissions are very frustrating because they would have made the level of privacy intrusion much clearer to the councillors who are considering this application. I believe all stakeholders just want to get this over with. Uh, if it is approved, then here are my three requests to the planning committee. Firstly, the parapet wall and screen fencing on the southern elevation of the, uh, of the patio um, does not extend to the eastern side overlooking my property overlooking my garden. I therefore ask that uh, such screening or parapet wall uh, be included and set back two metres from the edge uh, to protect my privacy. Second, the planning office is summing up, sets out a condition that the hedge on the eastern boundary with Chapel Hill should be replanted where necessary and kept at a minimum height of one and a half metres above the wall. Uh, it isn't clear what where necessary means and who makes that judgment. Figure eight from the presentation uh, clearly shows a complete gap of around four metres and a further section of around seven metres of dead or dying hedge, which is as an effective screen is worthless. In other words, a run of approximately 11 metres of mature hedging needs to be planted, and this will need to be mature, um, i.e. about two metres tall plus, as opposed to plugs of 50 centimetres, which would take years to grow. Therefore, please could the wording of this condition be strengthened accordingly. Third, to date, the only cause I've had for complaint to the applicant direct <clears throat> has been the clouds of dust generated by the cutting of stone and grinding out of pointing. The health hazard of inhaling such dust billowing onto our property was a major concern. An 30 seconds phase, remain. Thank you. An imminent phase in the project is, of course, the construction of the garage, which will likely mean a significant amount of stone cutting with consequent dust and noise. I would therefore ask the committee to require that effective dust and noise suppressant equipment be in place for the duration of such work. And as a final point, the applicant used to notify neighbours when deliveries would block the road. Um, unfortunately, this, this courtesy lapsed some time ago and would ask that it be reinstated. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions for Mr Thomas? No? Thank you, Mr Thomas. Mrs. Kirby? Hello, uh, Hello, Mrs. Kirby. Just take your time. You've got three minutes for when you're ready. All right, thank you. Uh, well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Sheila Kirby and I live at Liso's on Chapel Hill. My property abuts Clover Lee. The proposed garages will have a severe impact upon my property and me personally. The proposal will have an overbearing effect on my property due to the height and extent of the building. The original planning consent stated that the structure could only be visible from the shared driveway. This is clearly not the case with the latest proposal, which is clearly, clearly demonstrated in the photographs I have submitted. My photographs demonstrate that this building will obstruct natural daylight and block out the sun at certain times of the day and year. The height of this propo proposal will have a huge impact upon my privacy and tranquility, as people on the roof terrace will be able to clearly see into my living accommodation and into my main garden to the property and its seating area. 
my late husband and I, sorry, just take and I moved to this property 18 years ago because it felt we felt it provided us with a private, peaceful environment in which we could live out until the end of our days. I trust the committee will ensure the correct decision is made. So this remains the case for the welfare of the community which reside at Chapel Hill. Thank you. Thank you. Have we got um, pictures to be shown from Mrs. Kirby? Yes. There Apologies. Are, I couldn't. Are, um, I'm just going to see. I don't. I've got pictures supplied by Mr. and Mrs. Hardwick. Um, Mrs. The, Kirby's picture is the same one. Um, Oh, with the ladder on. With the ladder from Councillor Miller. Thank you. Okay. That's it. And I think this, I think the next one as well. That, yeah, that's from their window. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Are there any questions for Mrs. Kirby? Thank you very much, Mrs. Kirby. Thank you. And our last speaker on the objections is Mrs. Hardwick. Hello, Mrs. Hardwick. You have three minutes when you're ready. Thank you. Um, the reason for speaking today is not personal. It is to protect the area in which we live. The use of the huge terrace will overlook and intrude on our privacy and cause noise nuisance. This is demonstrated by my images. The garage roof terrace will be 45 foot long and approximately 50 foot wide. The garage sticks out and is not tiered into the hillside at all. The hedge and wall on the lane side is at present eight foot tall. This is nowhere near high enough to screen the terrace at all. It would take years to grow the required height to hide the terrace and people standing on it. The suggested extra height of the hedge mentioned as a condition in the planning officer's report is not enough. The terrace will in effect be a huge stage towering over the hedge and people using it will look down into the gardens of the neighbourhood neighbouring properties. Because of the sloping nature of the hillside, our garden is lower than Cloverley, but our seating area is at the top of our garden, which is nearest to Cloverley. The sounds of people talking on the huge patio will be funneled downwards to us because we're lower than the terrace. This has been demonstrated during construction as we are able to hear every word of the builders' conversations and there is no escape from their radio in our garden. This is beyond the normal noise associated with neighbours due to the fact that it will be projected from a position so much higher than everyone else. The terrace is large enough to hold a very large party and would easily accommodate all the paraphernalia associated with gardens, but as the roof terrace is not at a normal garden height and towers over everyone else, this would intrude into all the neighbours' privacy. Once built, it will be there forever for the applicant and any subsequent owner to use as they see fit, spoiling the peace and privacy of the area. The mature trees have been removed, which were mentioned as screening the patio in the first application. I'm concerned that if floodlit, the patio will destroy the dark skies that we enjoy at the moment. The suggested condition of a 1.5 metre high hedge above the wall is nowhere near enough to protect us from the noise and the fact that we will all be overlooked. 30 seconds remain. Um, I hope you'll consider my images and the comments as this terrace will have such a huge negative effect and impact on the lives of, of the neighbours of Cloverley if it's allowed to go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions for Mrs Hardwick? Councillor Armitage? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, uh, just one question. During the uh, uh, Adrian's uh, address, he said that uh, the, there were no uh, windows overlooking this uh, on your property. 
Uh, could you please confirm uh, the situation, please? Uh, yeah, I was a bit confused by that and the fact that it said that, that we'd got no windows in habitable rooms, which I didn't understand. We've got two small windows in the, the lounge that I'm sat in at the moment that are above where we park our cars, which was shown on the picture, which is directly opposite. And on the lane, we've actually got a kitchen window as well. Right. And uh, perhaps you could uh, re-emphasize the, the noise factor. You seem to Yeah, be... it's the noise. The noise is the biggest factor for us. Other neighbours are going to be far more troubled by being overlooked. The noise, because in our garden, there has been no escape. This The summer, during the first lockdown, we weren't able to go out in our garden due to the noise. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any further questions? Thank you, Mrs Hardwick. Are there any questions for the planning officers? Hmm? Chair, there's another speaker yet. Oh, sorry. I um, beg your pardon. Yeah, Mr Mike Wakeman. Wakeman. Um, Mr Wakeman, are you there? Yes, I'm here, yes. Okay, you have three minutes, Mr Wakeman. Okay, thank you. Um, the application seeks permission to reposition the garage by two metres. This was necessary due to adverse ground conditions, which meant that we had to build a separate wall, which is what you can see on the photographs. And that was because we had to shore up the ground around the house when we excavated for the garage. Since the brief submission to try and help address the concerns that the neighbours have put forward, we've reduced the height of the garage by half a metre. Um, the roof and parapet wall will step down from the terrace. And there won't be, we propose that there's no access to the, the first two metres of roof. I believe that the already granted permission that we have established that this development does not contravene policy. However, Ashover policy has been cited in some of the objections, which I think are, are invalid. We have very much respect the shape and the form of the property, whilst developing significant enhancements to it. We've got skilled stonemasons working on the project with English heritage experience. We're using reclaimed Derbyshire stone to clad all visible parts of the garage where they are not inset into the hill, sorry. Um, we've got four adults living, we'll, we'll have four adults living in the property. We've got four garage spaces. Uh, we think that's entirely appropriate. People have mentioned that it's, it's just too big a development. Um, but obviously with having space for cars, we're having to avoid on-street parking. And in addition to that, the garage will house the plant room, which we have for the ground source heat pump for the property. Um, I don't believe that the, the development does adversely affect neighbouring properties because we've, we've maintained significant distances between the development and the boundaries. Um, it's three point metres away from the nearest party wall with, with lease hose, which is a further four to five metres away from that party wall and is set at an angle away from Clover Lee. The other side of the development is over two metres away from the party wall, which the other side of that wall is um, Chapel Hill Road itself, and the nearest property um, there is, is Touchstone. The view from the roof garden will overlook Cloverlee's long garden down to the shared access road, which is over 17 metres away, that access road from the, from the development. No private gardens are overlooked. Only Leeso's driveway, Touchstone's entrance gate area and other driveways can be seen at the sides. These are areas that are already open to public view, either via Chapel Hill or via the access road. We're retaining all party walls and setting back the development. The garage will be mainly under, underground as we've structurally designed to take a garden and lawn on top. We're taking great care to ensure it blends into the surroundings, does not impose on neighbours and protects our own privacy. Diversion of watercourses onto Chapel Hill has also been cited. This is also not true. All runoff has been channeled into a new connection to the public drain. Six seconds remain. Which is as approved by Seven Trent. And we're also using rainwater recycling systems, which have ultimately reduced the amount of water that the property puts into the, into the public system. To summarise, I think that we've breathed new life into a very, very tired property. We've taken the effort to source new matching stone for that property locally from Kelstage. That's three minutes, we've Chair. We've got reclaimed Derbyshire stone to ensure it blends beautifully into the surroundings, and we're using traditional stone building methods with new technology. Thank you, Mr Waitman. Footprint and sustainability of the property. Uh, is there any questions for the speaker? <laughs> 
Councillor Armitage. Yes, Chair. Uh, presumably, you, you say you've had uh, ground conditions, uh, you've had problems with them. Uh, yeah. Did you have a surveyor do the job first and check on these problems? Yes, we had a survey, we had a, a whole topographical survey of the site before, before we started work. But as you know from seeing many, well, if you watch ground designs, you know that there's always problems until you get out of the ground. And unfortunately, we have problems. Yeah, uh, but I would have thought a survey would have shown these up. I mean, we're not talking ground designs here. We're talking about uh, a garage in uh, Ashover. Well, the survey showed that this, the sort of ground that we were dealing with, um, which is which is mainly compacted clay and sandstone. Um, and then, you know, depending on the weather conditions which we had um, last last winter, that's what really set us back quite considerably. And we had to, to shore up the ground and put in that... Um, that retaining wall which you see on the photos right uh you've got four parking space for uh room for four cars in the in the garage right. uh it, it is a little bigger than that uh but that's to do with the heat pump is it well there's provision for the for the for the uh, plant remess for the heat pump that's correct yeah yeah uh but don't you already own a garage across the way there is a small garage at the, at the bottom of the hill, yes. Right. So that's, you, but that's not um, not really very long or very or very tall when you're uh, over six foot. So you, you've, in actual fact, you've got a garage in for five vehicles. And that's potentially true, yes. Right. Thank you. Are there any further questions for Mr. Waitman? No. Thank you, Mr. Waitman. Thank you. Um, any questions now for planning officers? And I know Councillor Barry would like to start the ball rolling. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think the only question I've got really, I mean, looking at the conditions that the officers have already placed on um, the application, is one to do with lighting. Um, I think if we could put something in there that would restrict any extra outdoor lighting so that it, you're not getting the air pollution the same. Um, other than that, I'm minded to go with officers' recommendations. Any other comments for the officers, Councillor Shipman? Yeah, I just wanted to do, I wondered if one of the officers just could clarify this is the windows, isn't the windows thing, because we're obviously in a situation now where, where there's some residents here quite rightly saying that they don't want to be uh, people looking through the windows, then officers telling us that there is no windows. Oh, can we just have some clarity on that, please? Alice, isn't one of your pictures shows the cottages opposite? Yes, if Nikki's able to bring back the presentation, Chair, yeah, that would be it would be helpful. It would be uh, useful to show a couple of slides. I think that may help. Um, it's below there, Nikki. That one. Um, oh. Um, not not uh, stop stop about there. Um, no, it's not those. It's the one showing the the stone wall as you come up the road. It must be higher up. Apologies. Where's the, the first, one of the entrance that have the cottages on the right? The first photo. The first photo of the photos. That up one. A bit, Nikki, please. So that one there. That one. Yeah. So there's. So this, sorry. Go on. Sorry. There's that window there, but that looks down the lane not onto the um onto the applicant's site and then if you can go um right to the end nikki please one of the um uh, stakeholders photos uh which is not just a bit further uh, uh, no up 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 that one that that shows the end elevation of that same cottage which shows a brown door in it but i can't see what are those window. two windows on the left there um, they're they're touchstone are they not being overlooked from this standard i mean it looks they're like not, it's they're not the ones that mrs hardwick mentioned Mrs. Hardwick lives in the the property with the with the brown door, I believe. 
further to the right, that one there, Nikki. Yes, with the, with the windows that Alice has just discussed with you, Councillor Shipman. So I I I'm, I am I'm also confused about the the issue of the windows that Mrs Hardwick mentioned. Did she mention the kitchen window? There was two windows in in the living room. She said. What are the, what's that property on the left of the photo with the two with the two windows there? That's where Mr. Thomas lives, I believe. That's that's Touchstone. And of course, they're, they're higher up the hill and, and set can back I, from the uh, the site boundary. Can I just ask Adrian, um, just for clarification about windows and about view and about light? Am I right in saying that they're not actually a, a planning consideration uh, because of the distance away from the property? Certainly, as far as far as officers are concerned, our conclusion is that the impact on neighbouring windows is not overriding in, in our view in terms of impact from people standing or using the patio area in whatever form in terms of looking into those other other windows. That's that's not a, a concern that we we've expressed in our report and um, certainly as, as Alice has mentioned the windows further down the lane don't look in our judgment onto the site they look along the, the shared access way and onto Chapel Hill itself and those two windows that Councillor Shipman has just raised are set back from the back from the site and you can see that on your on your papers at, in Touchstone so they're set back into the site so that's not are uh, an issue that we would raise concerns about in, in, in terms of the impact on windows in Lee Sows. As, as you've seen, you can look from those windows on Lee Sows to the patio but to gain a view into the next door property of those windows from the, the patio area would, in my judgment, be very difficult, both in terms of distance and the fact you would be looking up into those windows rather than looking down into them. And as, as, as you probably all know, if you look down some somewhere it's much easier to gain a view whereas if you're looking up it is much more difficult because you're looking into a dark area and at the ceiling normally so so that wouldn't be our a consideration that, that we as officers would place significant weight on i think that's correct alice isn't it in in our consideration um just just um i don't know if that answers councillor barry's query but but in terms of the the noise and disturbance which you've heard a lot about unfortunately any development brings with it noise and disturbance and, and dust and activity and deliveries etc and it wouldn't normally be our consideration to seek to restrict those um, on a development of this size and scale on larger developments yes we might but if that was a concern of members we could impose a condition that restricted when and where development could take place normally that would be um, excluding some days if that was an overriding consideration of members but otherwise dust, noise, etc., and normally issues addressed by colleagues in environmental health. Thank you. Councillor Reader, then Councillor Armitage. To sort of ask, um, Alice, um, on the picture that we've just seen that Councillor Shipman was sort of asking the questions about the two windows, is that the uh, where the hedge is going to be replanted? Can I just check that? Is that where that hedge will be replanted so it will offer the screening? Yeah. Sorry, um, those two windows, are, I think that one's touchstone, isn't it? Um, that's where I was proposing that we would condition that that hedge is, re, uh, is replanted. So, yeah, you can see it there. Um, yeah, that, that would, it would be that section. Uh, um, yeah. Does it go all the way along and will it screen the two windows? It would certainly screen the bottom window. I suppose possibly not so much the top one, um, but that is that set quite far back. If you go to, um, Nikki, if you go up to um, one of the photos a bit further up, um, if you keep going up, uh keep going sorry <laughs> a bit further 
Um, next one, next one up, I think. Yeah. Um, or just, yeah. No, the next one up, actually. Sorry. That one. That's taken from just outside the gate of Touchstone. So you can see that there's already hedge to the top of the wall that could be thickened up. And then there's the gap, but there was a tree there, I think. Um, but that, that was where I was proposing that that would be thickened up and, and maintained at a certain height. Um, and we I could- I think that I'm mindful to agree with the gentleman that was speaking earlier about this hedge and, and saying that, you know, it's not, not very good at the moment. So I understand what you're saying with regard to thickening up. But I hmm. do believe that perhaps it does need to go, like the gentleman was saying, a little bit higher. So there's, it offers that extra bit of screening. Yeah, yeah. I think. I mean, we could we can um, condition it at higher than I suggested. Yeah, if I can add to to that, um, if if members were were and are concerned about the issue of the screening on one or either side of the patio. Another option, of course, would be to require a screen wall or a screen fence on the very edge of the patio area itself, which wouldn't then require either the hedge to grow or be uh, await its growing up to a certain height. You could impose a condition to that effect, but it would, of course, increase the, the built form of the, the patio. The other thing that members may wish to do, and which we've, we've previously discussed with the applicant, is to um, instead of having a, a wall right at the end of his two metre extended garage is to require that wall to be two metres set back to replicate exactly what has been approved previously and to condition that other two metres isn't used as a patio, balcony or veranda. So that would be another option and then that would just leave um, the area of usable patio exactly the same scale as that which has been previously approved on the application which um, didn't attract any objection or concern at the time so that would be another option we would need to be careful in the way that we condition that but that could also be done if the issue of screening was a particular concern to members and you wish to restrict the active active use of the patio to exactly the area that was previously approved the, the issue that Councillor Barry mentioned about lighting, I, I didn't answer that, I apologise. But yes, if there were, was concern about lighting of the patio area, then you could impose a condition requiring a scheme of all external lighting to be agreed by the council and no other external lighting then to be attached, constructed or erected on the, on the feature, on the building or the garage, however you want to describe it. Excuse me. <coughs> Hopefully that helps, Chair. Councillor Armitage. Yeah, I think I think you, uh, the point that's been missed by everybody is the fact that it's uh, the ground is falling away. And if you look at the picture, the one with the ladder, uh, if we go back to that, it's going to stick out a long way. And it doesn't matter how high the head the edge is. Uh, it's going to be something like four and a half metres high. If we just uh, move that, there you are, and that's how high it is. And if somebody stands on top of that, how high do you want a hedge? You know, if somebody, it's, uh, it's four and a half metres high, and uh, somebody of two metres, that's six and a half metres, somebody standing on top of that parapet. Uh, well, you know, you're going to have to have a quite a high hedge to screen that far higher than than you can see. And this is the fact: is you brought it forward. The 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 plan has been to bring it forward, and uh, it's going to cause a relocation uh, uh, of this. And as far as the garden's concerned, it's going to go. You know, there was, isn't going to be much of a garden. Is asking for uh, garaging for four vehicles, which is things are all right. Well, most detached houses only have for two, but there again, you, uh, you seem to be uh, in favour of the four, uh, in spite of the fact that he has a, a fifth garage 
in, a, in another location at the end. As far as I'm concerned, uh, it's, it's looking directly into the garden next door, uh, the uh, Mrs. Kirby, and it has greatly upset her, as you could tell. Uh, she's lived there all her life, and this is causing her great stress. And you've got to think about local people. The massing is too great. Uh, it's against the, uh, it's not in accordance with AP1, A, B, D, and H. It's against policy GS5 and local plan H5. And it's been done. Uh, all this concrete was poured far, uh, you know, and as far as I was concerned, there was no planning permission to move it, but the base work has been done. And uh, it's, uh, you know, it's just basically gone against all the plans. And, uh, and it is a retrospective uh, development. And if you can't see that, well, I, you know, I feel sorry for you, quite frankly. I mean, you know it's retrospective. And here we are, another retrospective one. Adrian, you want to come in? Yes, a few points, if I, if I may, Chair, that hopefully help. Um, we've had the discussion about retrospective applications earlier on this afternoon. The fact it's a retrospective application, whether it is or not, and I think I disagree um, on the certainty of that with counter armitage in this case, but whether or not it's a retrospective application, you need to consider it on its merits and whether or not it's acceptable in terms of comparison with your policies and any other material matters. It's not been constructed and finished, so to my view, that it isn't probably a retrospective application, but it's clearly the way that the building on site is being constructed to conform with what is proposed now in this application rather than what has previously been granted consent. If you... Listen, Adrian, as far as I'm concerned, it's Would retrospective. You help me, oh. Can you just wait until Adrian's finished, please? I thought he had. I'm sorry. E even so, Chair, e even if you believe that the application in, in its current form or in the current form proposed is not acceptable. You may wish to grant a consent subject to conditions, which is why I've suggested that maybe walling either side of the patio, maybe having the front wall step back two metres from the front of the building and excluding use beyond that to mirror what's been consented, may well address the concerns of members in avoiding looking to either side of the structure into other gardens or into other windows potentially that that may then address that issue just in terms of the, the photograph chair as i mentioned right at the start they are not photos that we as officers have brought before you they're, they're photos that have been brought before you by other stakeholders and therefore you need to uh, take them on their face but the problem with photos annotated photos in particular is they're 3d and the photos that you've seen taken from Liso's towards the application site showing the ladder is in 3D and the structure is 3.5 meters set back from the boundary with Liso's into the site. So when you see it in 3D, in my opinion, it's not as stark as that photograph depicts. Just in terms of that as well, Chair, uh, Alice will need to correct me if I'm wrong here, but with the parapet wall on top of the structure, that's the 4.5 meters that is being referred to. So that's not ground level of the, the structure, that's taking into account that parapet wall as well, which is approximately one meter in height, I think, Alice, if that's correct. So anyone that's standing on that additional bit of garage would be, depending on the height, of course, um, another 0.5 to perhaps 0.8 meters taller than that. So that's the, the context you need to put it in. But, but again, I come back to the point that if members are concerned about overlooking and the impact on neighbours. You may feel that with the imposition of conditions that we've discussed, that may address the concerns, albeit it will increase the bulk of the structure in terms of those size, because you would normally be looking for walls or fences at 1.8 metres high to um, address any sideways looking. So that's another 0.8 metres on top of that wall as that photo depicts, albeit if you come back two meters from the front of that structure as permitted, then of course that length of, of overlooking, the, the length of area of overlooking would be reduced. I do hope that uh, that helps. Yeah, happy to uh, answer any further questions. Thank you. If I could come back to you now. now 
uh, Chair. Uh, can I come back to Adrian on that? Yes. Right. Uh, on this question of retrospective, when somebody digs footings in, right, uh, on a planning application, uh, uh, you will say that 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 they've started work, and this has had the footings put in and concrete poured on, so they have started work. Council Shipman's shaking his head. Come on, <laughs> let's have your own. If you pave your drive, you've not started a development. It's the equivalent of that. You, if you, there, there's certain things which trigger a planning application that needs to go in, starting paving your drive is not, or concreting your drive is not that starting point. It's building the walls. You start building the walls and roof, and the planning application started. No, it's if you if you dig the trench to put the footings in, that's started. Councillor Barry needs to speak. Yeah, I think we've had a lot of discussion around this. Mm -hmm. um, the only, area, you know, and I think we, we need to be moving on with this application. So I'd like to put the motion forward that we go with office recommendations and putting into that the conditions that have been spoken about, about the hedging and about the lighting. Um, and I, I think we need to move this policy, this I would second that chair. I would second that chair with the um, conditions. And I think Councillor Shipman's also nodding. Yeah. Okay. So, for clarification, then, Alan, before we take the vote, just need clarification, Chair, if I may, on um, the uh, ish, additional conditions that uh, mm -hmm. Councillor Reader and Councillor Shipman and Councillor Barry have mentioned, Chair, please. And also, if if um, members are minded to to grant consent, if that could be words finalised, delegated to myself in consultation with yourself and Councillor Barry, Chair. Thank you. Right. So that effectively then, Chair, is to move off as the recommendations with the uh, specific um, references uh, to hedging and lighting um, discussed at the meeting now, with the final wording to be agreed uh, by the planning development manager, along with yourself and Vice Chair. Has yeah, that I captured it, members? I think there's always also the shaping of the balcony. And so the conditions on the shaping of the balcony? Yeah, just a clarity on that, Chair. Are you um, are you you asking for? I, I'm taking it that you're not asking for walling or fencing on side of the extended parapet as we've discussed. But are you now talking about bringing the the front wall back it to, to the two meter line, precluding any use beyond that? It's what you said before, Adrian. Yes. Yeah. Just so it can be absolutely clear, Chair, I understand that. Now, you don't want the final two metres to be used as balcony, parapet or veranda. You want the limit to be to the extent as previously approved. I understand that bit. Just need clarity, Chair, that members aren't voting on the provision of any wall or screen fencing either side of the patio, just relying on the condition that Alice has discussed about allowing the hedge to grow to an appropriate level. Yes. Yeah. yeah, that's on, that's on both sides, Adrian. So, yeah. both, so both residents either side are obviously their concerns can be dealt with. Yeah, but it, it's it's a green finish rather than a hard um, yes. stone or fence finish. Thank you. So okay. the motion would be then um, to uh, go with officer recommendations subject to those conditions. Yes, that's fine. Is um, Nikki ready for a roll call? Thank you, Chair. So the motion stands to, to approve with conditions. If you could clearly say for, against, or abstain. Councillor Armitage. Against. Councillor Barry. For. Councillor Cooper. For. Councillor Huckabee. For. Councillor Potts. For. Oh. Councillor Powell. Against. Councillor Reader. For. Oh. Councillor Rouse. For. Oh. Councillor Ruff. For. Oh. Councillor Shipman. For. Oh. Chair, I make that eight votes for two against with zero abstentions which means uh, that motion has been carried 
Thank you. Thank you all for that. Moving on to item five, planning appeals lodged and determined. Over to you, Aidan. I don't wish to um, prolong members' attendance this afternoon beyond um, that which you wish, Chair. So I'll just very briefly make reference and ask members to take particular note of the fourth appeal dismissed, which is the Land Allocation Limited appeal. Um, it is a very interesting appeal on a number of aspects, Chair, in that the, the inspector in that appeal um, has taken a different tack to a number of inspectors previously in terms of what he considered were the basket of most appropriate policies in, in, in reference to the, the determination of the appeal. He concluded that the basket of policies led him to place weight on the development plan in that respect, that they conform to the MPPF. And importantly, Chair, he concluded that the tilted balance, so-called tilted balance, wasn't um, activated, which is in contrast to the, the conclusions that the inspector of the Tib Shelf Road Home would appeal, and in stark contrast to that. It does, Chair, and um, members will perhaps have no sympathy with me on this aspect, but it does make it difficult for us as officers to give clear guidance to, to you as members, because there doesn't seem to be any consistent path coming forward from inspectors who should all undertake the same training and have the same knowledge as one another but uh, obviously we, we will continue to try and uh, and help members on on that but i think what, one thing it does suggest is that where you have these large-scale housing developments you need to be quite clinical in the evaluation of the policies that you have both in your extant local plan and hopefully soon in a in an adopted plan uh, that will replace that and clinically assess which policies you're taking into account and the weight you attach to them with evidence as necessary to support them. In terms of land allocations, Chair, as, as you know, we required a team of um, people to support the council in that and there was good evidence provided by the landscape architect, Mr. Jeff Cock. So again, I think um, having that investment in that expertise paid dividends in this respect, Chair, and we will need to do that in the future in advising you. The other thing, just to bear in mind, I'm sure this won't have been lost on members who've read the appeal decision, was the conclusions that the inspector came to on highway safety grounds. And uh, I'll, I'll leave members perhaps to review the appeal decision and, and come to your own view on that. Uh, as, as you know, as officers, we take on board the advice of the, uh, the county council, but it does suggest that again, um, which we try and do as officers, honestly, I, I can say honestly, we do, and we try and evaluate what's said to us. But as you know, in, in for the most part, we go with the Highway Authority. But it does show that um, you need to take and evaluate that. But I come back, Chair, to the issue I always make to, to members is that we were able to put forward evidence to the inquiry from the gentleman that we asked to provide that evidence to us. So that advice still pertains that we need to have evidence but perhaps in the future, if members are concerned about highway safety advice that we're getting, and it is you feel absolutely integral to your decision and you're not happy with the highway advice that we've got, the possibility of getting independent advice before you make your decision may be something you would wish to consider down the line. So just those, those elements, Gerald, other than that, we're, as officers, very pleased with the, the decisions that we received this last <laughs> month. Um, Certainly the one in respect to the list of building at Killer Marsh, which, um, which we're very pleased that the inspector supported us on. But, but certainly the land allocation one, and to, um, to a lesser extent the others, but Mr and Mrs Treese, is, it was, was interesting as well in terms of the issues that were raised there. But certainly land allocations does, does warrant a second reading if, um, if you already read it, and, and a first reading if you've not had the chance to do so. Thank you, Adrian. Happy to take any questions, Chair, but I, I've known members have had a long afternoon, so I don't want to uh, to keep uh, members here unnecessarily. Are there any questions? Jolly good. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate it. it's been a really long afternoon. Thank you very much. I wish you all a happy Christmas and New Year, and I'll see you then. Yeah. I, I, there's no urgent business, Chair, so thank you. Thank you. Um,